American Confusions, 1945 to 1950. The American response to Soviet refusal of post-war cooperation was confused and tentative. For months after the Truman administration recognized it in situa the situation, it was reluctant to make any public announcement of this fact because of our military demobilization. Uh, it could, could not uh, re be reversed until it had run its course in 1947 and until a new strategic system and, co and consequent military organization could be reached. For this reason, the first announcement came from Winston Churchill in a speech in Fulton, Missouri in June 1946. In this, he spoke of their Iron Curtain, which Stalin was lowering between the Soviet bloc and the West. It was also British initiative over Greece and Turkey at the end of the year, which led to the Truman Doctrine in March 1947. Truman could not get any constructive help from the leaders of the armed forces in establishing a new strategy. They were too much busy fighting each other in protection of the vested interests surviving from World War II. So he was forced to fall back on other forms of resistance, particularly econ economic, diplomatic, and ideological. The resulting strategy is known as containment. It lasted from early 1947 to 53, and was resumed gradually after 58. Its chief characteristics were economic and financial aid to other nations to eliminate the misery and ignorance which fostered communism and acceptance of the rights of neutrals and allies to follow their own policies to be consulted on, on our policies with primary reliance on our military force. In early, as early as August 1945, Truman asked the Joint Chief Staff, uh, JCS, to draw up recommendations for America's post-war security needs. The bitter rivalries among the three services made it impossible for JCS to agree any common strategy, and thus they could not ascertain the country's weapon needs. <clears throat> At the time, the Air Force was convinced that the next war would be very brief and would be settled by Strategic Air Command dropping atom bombs on enemy cities. In its view of the Army and Navy's roles would be restricted to mopping up after SAC had defeated the enemy. Accordingly, it wanted 70 air groups of the new six-engine propellered B-36 bombers, Convair, which flew in a prototype in 1946 after six years' work, but which would not be available in quantity after 1949, when jet propulsion made them obsolete. The Navy in 1945 made, uh, was much uh, larger than all other navies of the world combined, a five-ocean navy to fight a no-ocean opponent said the Air Force, but its future had been placed in great jeopardy by the atom bomb tested tests staged at Bikini Atoll in the Pacific in 1946. These tests showed that a fleet would suffer very great damage unless widely dispersed from atomic explosions in the air, while a blast underwater would drench it with almost er eradicable radioactivity. Nonetheless, the Navy had to seek a role in the growing rivalry with Russia and pinned its hopes on its ability to reach the enemy with atom armed planes flown from the deck of 65,000 ton supercarrier of astronomical, astronomical cost. The army, almost eclipsed by the plans of its more glamorous rivals, wanted universal military training, UMT, leading to highly trained reserve units. In spite of the Air Force's insist, insistence that the World War III would be over before ground forces could be mobilized, these, agree these disagreements between services made it impossible for the JCS to achieve any agreement on strategy or weapons needed needs and answers uh, to Truman's request of 1945. Accordingly, in June 1946, they informed the president that a unified strategy could be reached only after achievement of a unification of the three services into a single organization. For this reason, it was not until April 1950 that the U.S. obtained a strategic military po policy to underlie Truman's policy of containment, which was then three years old. The new strategic policy was embodied in NS NSC 68, which, despite its code identification, did not come from the National Security Council, but was the child of the policy planning staff of the State Department, led by Paul Nitz. The inability of the armed services to provide the country with a defense policy because of in inter-service rivalries is a consequence of the fact that the military leaders are specialists and technicians concerned with means rather than with goals, and like all technicians, need guidance or goals set by other persons with large perspectives. This weakness is more obvious in peacetime than in war, and is more common among Americans than among others. Uh, Americans work together best uh, when the organization's goal is explicitly established. In this, they differ from the British, who can work together perfectly well in organizations without any apparent goals and are indeed suspicious of any desire to establish explicit goals or overriding policy. Americans, when goals are established, as they are in business in peacetime by the balance sheet or as they are in war by the desire for victory, work together very effectively, but political work is peacetime. 
uh, with its ambiguous goals, is relegated to rivalry, bickering, and total inability to relate means to goals. As a result, the means themselves tend to become goals. It was the emphasis upon means rather than goals and the compromises between con conflicting means which led to the National Security Act of 1947. This sought to evade the need for clear, hard thinking about goals and the subordination of means to goals by reorganization of the top levels of governmental operation concerned with security. <clears throat> it set up a system based on uh, secrecy and anonymity, which may, in time, revolutionize the whole American system of government. In this reorganization, there were at least three major parts. One, unification of armed services. Two, creation of the National Security Council as an advisory board to the president. And three, reorganization of the whole system of intelligence and spying through the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, and the code-breaking National Security Agency, NSA. Basically, a rivalry among the American Armed Services was a rivalry for congressional appropriations, a struggle over slicing the annual budget. In this struggle, each service sought to convince congressmen that its particular weapons provided the best defense for the U.S., the Air Force, which in 1946 was still a branch of the Army, touted the claims of the manned bomber, the Navy, on only recently disillusioned with its old love, the battleship, had now shifted its affections to the aircraft carrier. The Army had to stick with the humble foot soldier, but almost concealed him from the view with its insistence on trucks, tanks, and cannon. As a matter of fact, the manned bomber, the aircraft carrier, and the tank were all obsolescent in 1946, but their supporters were unwilling to concede this since such a concession would, they thought, shift appropriations to the other services. The manned, bomber w the manned bomber was threatened by rockets with homing devices which would bring such rockets at speeds higher than manned bombers could ev ever reach in for the kill by seeking out the plane's engine exhaust heat or by use of radar and electronic eyes de devices. The aircraft carrier was threatened by atomic bombs since it was too vulnerable to these to justify its cost of over a hundred million. The tank was threatened by shaped charges and, in general, the whole tactical outlook of ground forces, with their traditional emphasis on mass and concentration, was challenged by nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, which would put great value on dispersal. In these struggles between the services, the clashes are particularly bitter in a period of demobilization, and this bitterness is accentuated by the fact that each service has alliances with the industrial complexes which supply their equipment. These complexes not only supply funds, such as advertising, for each service to carry its message to the Congress and the people, but also exert every influence to retain equipment and tactics in obsolescent modes and types, but newer models, by dangling before the higher officers who can influence contracts, offers a few a future well-paying consultant positions with the industrial firms concerned. Most higher officers of the American Armed Forces in the war and post-war period retired before the fixed age of 62, often on disability basis which exempted retirement pay from income taxes, and then took consultant jobs with industrial firms whose chief business was in war contracts. Thus, Force State Star General Brehan B. Somerville, Chief of Army Service Forces in World War II, retired on disability salary of 16000 a year at the age of 54 to join a number of industrial firms, including Coppers, which paid him 125000 Three-star General L.H. Campbell, Chief of Ordnance in World War II, retired on disability at 9000 a year at age 59, he became an executive at 50000 a year of firms from whom he had previously purchased $3 billion in armaments. Four-star General Clay retired at 52 on 16000 a year, but signed up at once with General Motors and Continental Can at over 100000 a year. Three-star Air Force General Ira C. Eaker left the service at age 50, with 9000 a year joined Hughes Tool Company at $50,000. Another three-star Air Force General, Harold C. George, went with Eaker to Hughes at $40,000. General Joseph T. McCarney in 1952 took his four stars and $16,000 a year to join Consolidated Volte at $100,000. There, these are just uh, but a few more than 100 general officers whose post-retirement alliances with industrial firms encouraged their successors, still on active service, to remain on friendly terms with such appreciative business and cor business corporations. These connections undoubtedly inhibit officers of the armed services in their efforts to obtain fresh ideas, fresh tactics, and fresh equipment for America's defense. In this struggle, there occurs rivalry between the services to secure large shares of existing budgets, but there also occurs cooperation to increase the total joint budget. The best way to do that la the latter is by war scares, which undoubtedly increase appropriations for all services. 
The spectacular increase in the joint defense budget of the United States from about $14 billion in the late 1940s to about $60 billion in the early 1960s is partly caused by a real Soviet threat to the U.S., but it is also partly caused by a scare engendered by the armed services. If the Soviet Union had been, had, had been deterred from aggression by those expenditures, the money was well spent, but since the Soviet Union never was, had never has had any intention of engaging the U.S. in open war, it is legitimate to believe that many of the billions spent could have been used to fight the Soviet Union in more remunerative ways than by purchasing manned bombers, aircraft carriers, or tanks. The struggles between the services and the U.S. after 1945 have been vigorous and often unscrupulous. They have involved putting pressure on administrators in the executive branch from the president down, and especially in high civilian heads in the Pentagon, of misleading congressmen and of propagandizing the public. <clears throat> the Air Force, for a variety of reasons, was the most successful of the three services in the propaganda war. After all, flyers had plenty of experience since they had been propagandizing the world since about 1908, five years after the first plane flew, without benefit of publicity in 1903. The Air Force was interested only in strategic bombing and had little interest in tactical work under command of ground forces, which, the flyers insisted, hampered their special genius. To get free of the Army and be become a separate service, co-equal with the Navy and the Army, the Army Air Forces in 1946 put their full pressure behind the legislation to unify the armed services. Unify here really meant change two into three. This was done by reducing the two, cap two cabinet posts for war and Navy to a single post for defense, with three equal secretaries for Army, Navy, and Air outside the cabinet. The unity, presumably, was to obtain was to be obtained from the Secretary of Defense's uh, control over the three service secretaries, but this was impossible since they were named by the President, not by the Secretary of Defense, and they had little influence over their services, each of which looked to its chief commander on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The fact that the Joint Chiefs had operational command of their departments meant that they had to defend the diverse interests of, of these and could contribute little to unity or to general ideas, even strategic ones. Well, if they had been separated from their actual commands in order to be free to reach a general consensus on strategic ideas, they would have retained no control over their services. The only real lines of authority in the whole system were those in the hands of the president himself and those lines of command going downward from the Joint Chiefs to their own services. There were only very weak lines between the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Chiefs or to his service secretaries, or between the latter and the services for which they were responsible. As a result, very little unification was achieved even after amendments to the act, and in 1949 the inter-service rivalries reached their most intense peak. By the end of that year, UMT, the supercarrier, and 70 Group Air Force were all dead, killed off by inter-service rivalries, in spite of the fact that all public opinion polls showed strong support for all of them. James Forenstall, who had been Secretary of the Navy since 1944, and who, on behalf of the Navy, had emasculated the unification bill, was made first Secretary of Defense and was called upon to administer in, in 1947. Within a year, he had reversed his opinions and was de demanding amendments to strengthen the act, especially the powers of his own post. His mind collapsed under, under the strain, and he resigned in 1949, committing suicide shortly afterward. Although public opinion polls showed that two-thirds of Americans approved UMT and only a quarter or less opposed it, the Air Force in 1948 was able to persuade the Congress that there was a necessary choice between UMT and the 70 Group Air Force. Accordingly, the Air Force budget was raised $822 million and the UMT was buried in the committee. Forrestal was replaced as Secretary of Defense by Louis Johnson, one-time National Commander of the American Legion, who favored the Air Force, as Forrestal had favored the Navy in these intramural battles. Although the supercarrier had been uh, authorized and appropriated for, the, although, and although construction had been begun under Forrestal, Johnston, Johnson used a vote of 2-1 to one in the JCS against it, Admiral Louis de Denfeld uh, in the minority, as an excuse for canceling the contract. The subsequent Admiral's re revolt took the form of anonymous letters to Congress charging corruption on the B-36 contract, as well as public charges, which were quite correct, that the plane was already obsolete. The whole scandal received a full-scale congressional investigation, the B-36 affair, as a result of which the B-36 was discredited, Admiral Denfeld was removed from the JCS, and Johnston, having alienated everyone by his efforts to save money, was replaced by General Marshall in 1950. The Unification Act had excluded retired officers from the post of Secretary of Defense, but this clause was made unapplicable to General Marshall so that it 
he could succeed Johnson in 1950. Thus, the supporters of each of the three services held the position successfully in less than a two-year period. Marshall said that he took the job to get UMT, but the act, uh, as passed in 1951, was in the form which allowed the administration to pre prevent its execution, and it never went into effect. In its place, troops were raised for the services, chiefly the Army, by successive extensions of the wholly unsatisfactory Selective Service Acts. The inner services uh, battles of 1945-50 to 50 were largely a victory uh, for the Air Force, which got rid of the supercarrier in the UMT and thus obtained the biggest bite from the budget. Much of this bite went to the SAC, which had been created in, in March 1946 and was taken over by the General George Kennedy by, Kenny by General Curtis E. LeMay in October 1948. At the time, SAC was uh, really... SAD sat starting in 1946 with only a single group able to deliver the atom bomb most of this period it struggled along with the 300 mile per hour B29 it lacked planes bases equipment and trained men above all it still operated on the old premise that the outbreak of war would be pre preceded by negotiations and mobilization LeMay changed all that. He was not a desk soldier, nor was he a paper pusher. R ruthless, efficient, single-minded. He flitted, he flitted about from base to base in a self-piloted plane, a big cigar clamped in a belligerent angle in his set jaw. He gave SAC a single purpose, mission. Isolated it from everything else in the defense chaos by moving its headquarters from Washington to Nebraska and demanded immediate and efficient war readiness. With sufficient funds, LeMay would have kept a third of SAC in the air at all times ready to go, and another third at war readiness for quick takeoff, and the final third on call within a few hours, until 1952, uh, when he began to get the new 8-jet Intercontinental B-52s, he bridged the gap with modified B-36s and a medium-range 6-jet B-46, B-47s, excuse me, uh, with, with the support of Air Secretary Thomas K. Finletter, he established uh, bases within the range of the Soviet Union in Europe, Greenland, and North Africa, and Okinawa. By 1955, he had a force of remarkable, remarkable efficiency and high morale, a success resulting from uh, three factors which provided a, less, a lesson for the organizational success, clear-cut mission, leadership, and continuity. The last quality was achieved by retaining a LeMay in command of SEC for eight years in violation of the established armed services practice of three to four year periods of rotation duty. In all this turmoil of controversy in 1947 to 50, the army the army had not been idle. Its struggles for promotions, pay increases, pre per perquisites, perquisites, and assignments were ensured success to some extent by creating a new kind of army, an army top heavy with officers and paper pushers, who worked from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. five days a week and had very little fighting effectiveness. This was done by setting up a structure of officers and auxiliary activities which absorbed almost all the total budget of department and non-combat lines and filled the com combat units with a small number of short-term draftees of very little combat value. In January 1952, for example, the Department of Defense had 5 million employees, of which 3.7 million were in uniform and 1.3 million were civilians. Thus, in uniform, uh, used... Uh, those in uniform used up $37 billion for pay, food, housing, and clothing, that is, $10,000 a head, in a total defense budget of $46 billion. The $1.3 million, uh, million civilians cost $5.2 billion of $4,000 each a year, uh, leaving only $3 billion in total defense budget for equipment, research, and other costs, which contribute directly to defense. The Army's share of 3.7 million uniformed personnel was 2 million, but that provided only 12 divisions, at most 150,000 men, for combat. <clears throat> in spite of these enormous expenditures, the puny combat effectiveness of the, this standing army was shown in the Korean War when nine-tenths of the officers in combat were reserves who had to be called from their peace, peacetime activities to fight. The Army's solution to the disappointments of Korea was more of the same. In June 1951, 
The Selective Service Act of 1948 was amended to drop the draft age from 19 to 18 and raise the authorized limit on men in active service from over 2 million to 5 million. That is, the qualitative deficiency of Korea were to be solved by quantitative increases of the same inadequate quality, a step which might not improve America's defense position but could justify increasingly rapid promotion for officers. The last few months, 1949, of, of 1949, include the major turning points in the whole period 1947 to 63. Three, ever, three events which marked this were the well-publicized B-36 crisis, the loss of China, the secret H-bomb crisis, which followed the explosion of the Soviet Union's first A-bomb in the August. Another significant event of the period was the organization of NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, following the Treaty of April 4, 1949, signed in Washington. This mutual defense pact to, sa to safeguard the freedom, common heritage, and civilian civilization of their peoples, founded in, on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and rule of law, had uh, signers, the, uh, the U.S., Canada, and 10 Western European countries, Iceland, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, France, the U.K., Portugal, Italy. In February 1952, Greece and Turkey joined the pact, and in May 1955, the German uh, Federal Republic became a member. The agreement was largely anchored on Germany. It flowed out of the threat provided by the Berlin blockade and directly implied the merging of West Germany into the Western camp. As the chief step in, step in this process, the three Western zones of Germany were merged into one, and in September 1949, the military rule of Germany was replaced by the Adenauer regime. Regi regime, yeah, regime, regime. <clears throat> Throughout this period, fear of communism is growing within the United States. The real threat, if any, behind this fear is still uncertain. The Soviet and communist hatred of the American way of life is well established in the existence of the American Communist Party, Party as a willing tool of the international communist conspiracy directed from Moscow is also beyond dispute. Such communists were undoubtedly engaged in supervision and, uh, and uh, espionage and were assisted in these efforts by fellow travelers and other sympathizers. Moreover, uh, some communists and fellow travelers were undoubtedly present in the government and, to a greater degree, in some area, other areas, notably certain labor unions, higher education, and especially a more creative end of uh, the entertainment field, such as the theater, writing, and Hollywood scenario production. On the other hand, the number of communists in the U.S., according to the FBI, was only about 75,000 in 1945 and fell steadily to 50,000 in 1950 and 3,000 in 1960. It is impossible to make, to make any real assessment of the influence of communists, either in government or out of it, in the period 1949 to 50, with which we are now concerned. This is equally true of the earlier years, going back to 1933, which, with which most of the charges, countercharges made in 1949 were concerned. The chief reason for this is that secrecy, while still prevails, was used by both sides to portray, by uh, selective publicity, a false picture. The falsehood, ma manipulation, selection, and distortion of evidence were prevalent on both sides and were used especially by the anti-communists. Not because they were less at addicted to the truth uh, than communists, but because they, on the offensive, were the ones who were raising the issues and exposing the evidence. Apparently, these anti-communists, including the press, the House Committee on the UN on, on Un-American Activities, HUAC, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, felt that a good cause justified shoddy or misleading methods. The Communist Party of the, U uh, of the United States, CPUS, like others throughout the world, was always, from its founding in 1919, tightly disciplined body of conspirators who pr whose primary allegiance was to the Soviet Union and whose secondary aim after the preservation of the Soviet Union, Union itself was to establish a similar regime in the U.S. Tactics varied from year to year and the party line shifted with changing political and world conditions without, however, abandoning these two goals. In 1935, the threat of fascism spreading through the world, uh, the Communist International, Comintern, adopted a popular front tactic which was essentially a temporary alliance of all non-fascist groups to oppose Nazi aggression and to support the Soviet Union against German attack. In this period, the Communist Party of the United States was a rel relatively open group with openly available headquarters and telephone numbers. With a good deal of cooperation and free exchange through a broad spectrum of political and social activities, a cooperation uh, uh, from the political center to the extreme political left. There was, at the time, a widespread disillusionment with the existing structure of society because of enormous unemployment, pervasive poverty, and Burgess paralysis in the face of economic stagnation and fascist aggression. Communist insistence that something be done about these things won widespread sympathy, even in the circles which were totally non-communist. The communists themselves took full advantage of this atmosphere by establishing communist, fr uh, establishing communist front 
and fellow traveler organizations of uh, all kinds. And uh, the distinction between party members and fellow travelers became very free, confused, and blurred. The communist command system, however, remained fully aware of who were devoted to their permanent goals and who were not, and retained general control under cover of all organizations they regarded as important. This ambiguous situation of left-wing fellowships began to break down in 1938-40 to as the complete dominance of Soviet national selfishness within communist parties everywhere became evident. At first, uh, at first in Spain, later in the Nazi-Soviet Pact of August 1939, and in the soviet Finnish War the following winter. For the American Communist Party, the chief turning point here was the enactment of the Foreign Agents Registration Act in 1940. The, U the U.S. Communist Party broke its affiliation with the Comintern and instead established a secret link between the Comintern and the U.S. Party, you know, chiefly through Gerhard Eisler, who was finally deported in 1949 and became an official of the Eastern German Communist regime. In 1943, the Comintern itself was officially dissolved by, dissolved by the Soviet government, although secretly it continued to exist. As part of this same process, in a sort of wartime common front, the U.S. party itself was dissolved in 1944 and reappeared at once as, as the Communist Political Association. Earl Browder, who personified the popular front tactic in the 1930s, continued as the head of the political association in the common front tactic until July 1945 when he was removed as a traitor to the Marxist-Leninist ideology and replaced by William Z. Foster. At the same time, the Communist Party of the United States was reestablished to pursue a more aggressive and narrower policy. The abandonment of the U uh, Uni United Front uh, approach in 1945 was a gross tactical error which almost totally destroyed the party in the next 15 years. It had been ordered from Moscow through the French communist leader, Jacques Duclos, and was, like other mistakes of the Kremlin at the same time, based on a totally mistaken conception of what the post-war world would be like. This misconception was firmly rooted in the greater misconception of Marxist-Leninist doctrine and assumed, one, that there would be a post-war economic depression, two, that the U.S. would relapse into isolationism, and three, that the U.S. and Europe, especially Britain, would engage in imperialist rivalry from the markets and economic advantages. Just as the new Soviet foreign policy prepared to exploit this anticipated chaos, so the SPUS was re reorganized to profit from the same chaos, instead it committed suicide. This collapse of the SPUS from 75,000 member, members with ample funds in 1945 to less than 3,000 members with hardly a dime 15 years later was assisted by the actions of the US state, United States government, the attacks of party members who were leaving it in droves, and the efforts of ex-members, political leaders, and intellectual bellwethers to strike at the SPUS in, sub, in substitute for their inability to strike at the USSR. Many of these virtuous warriors were fighting for their convictions, but at least an equally large number were fighting for their personal profit or their personal partisan advantage. In this effort to win personal advantage from a worthy struggle, leadership was taken by some of the ex-communists, the FBI, the House Committee on Un-American Activities. These anti-communists, some of them professionals, tried to demonstrate that the SPUS, by its penetration into the federal government under the New Deal, into labor unions or ed education, and into enter entertainment, especially Hollywood, had gravely endangered the nation. On the whole, from the perspective of decades, these charges, concerned with the period before 1945, seemed grossly exaggerated. On the other hand, the making of these charges in the period 1947 to 55 was very damaging to the country. The influence of communists within or outside government had been slight. It is, for example, almost imp impossible to find a single motion picture, book, or play which can be identified as having the influence in leading Americans to, uh, to feel favorably toward a communist system for this country. It is even difficult to find examples of such an effort. Uh, on the other hand, it is uh, possible to find examples of the books which gave a too favorable impression of the Soviet Union, just as it is possible to find favorable books on any country, including Tibet, Peron's Argentina, Castro's Cuba, or Trujillo's Dominican Republic. Some of these favorable books on the USSR, such as Lord and Lady Passfield's Soviet Communism, A New Civilization, 1935, or Albert Rye's William Williams, The Soviets, a book of the month club recommendation in 1937, undoubtedly had influence in establishing an unduly favorable, favorable position, uh, favorable picture of Soviet life, but their influence could not in any way be we compare in strengthening communism in the U.S. with the influence in that direction exercised by the breakdown of capitalist laissez fair economy in 1929 and 39, or with the failure of democratic countries to stand up to fascist aggression in Germany, Italy, Spain in that same decade. Espionage is another matter. Espionage. 
but this uh, more from the nature of espionage than the nature of communism, except for the very significant fact that the ideological appeal of communism to the half-educated makes it possible for the Soviet Union to obtain secrets without financial payments. In general, the nature of espionage is totally ignored by most people, and this ignorance was only increased by the activities of the anti-communist spy uh, agitations of the 1949-54 period. All past history shows that espionage has been generally successful and intelligence has been generally a failure. By this I mean that no country has had much success in keeping secrets in the 20th century as in all earlier centuries, but neither has any uh, other country had much success in evaluating or interpreting the secrets that it, it, it obtained. The, the so-called surprises of history have emerged not because the other countries did not have the information, but because they refused to believe it. The date of Hitler's attack on, West, on the West in May 1940 had been given to the Netherlands by the German counterintelligence office as soon as it was decided. The Western countries refused to believe it. The same was true of every one of Hitler's surprises. Stalin was given the date of German attack on the Soviet Union by a, a number of informants, including the U.S. Department of State, but he refu refused to believe it. Both of the Germans and Russians had the date of D-Day, but ignored it. The U.S. had available all the Japanese coded messages, knew that the war was about to begin, and that the Japanese fleet with at least four large carriers was loose and lost in the Pacific. Yet Pearl Harbor was a total surprise. This last point was so hard to believe once the evidence was available that the same groups who were howling about Soviet espion espionage in 1948-55 were also claiming that President Roosevelt expected and wanted Pearl Harbor. Both these beliefs, if they were believed, were based on a gigantic ignorance and misconceptions about the nature of intelligence. The whole purpose of secrecy in the government should not be uh, to keep information from other states, this is almost impossible, but to make it as difficult as possible for other states to get certain information so that when they do get such restricted information, it will be so intermingled with other information and misinformation that it cannot be evaluated promptly enough to do them much good. Any espionage systems get more information than it can handle rapidly. Any country should assume that the enemy has all its own secret information. The lessons of the past history fully support this assumption. Following every war, the discovery, the discovery is made that the enemy during the war had every other state's most cherished secrets. In fact, the most successful kind of a counter-espionage work is achieved not by preventing access to secrets, but by permitting access to information which is not true. This was done most successfully in 1943 in preparation for the American invasion of Sicily which was a surprise to the Germans because they had been provided through their espionage in Spain with false information about the invasion of the Balkans. The Germans had a somewhat similar success through their operation North Pole by which the Germans successfully took over operated the French underground in the associated British espionage net in the large portion of France about a year for about a year. Um, finally, it is not generally recognized by outsiders at all. Almost all the information gathered by any espionage net is non-secret material fully available to anyone as public information. Even in the work against this super secret area like the Soviet Union or in nuclear secrets, this is true. Alan Dulles said that one more than 90% of the information which the CIA gathers on the Soviet Union is non-secret. Soviet espionage uh, reports on the U.S. must uh, contain at least 97% non-secret material. Many, if not most, of the spies and atomic spies apprehended uh, with high power publicity by the FBI and Un-American Activities Committee in 1948-54, to the great alarm of the American people, <clears throat> were not concerned with secrets, while some of them were not engaged in espionage at all, and almost none of them had anything to do with nuclear secrets, uh, contrary to public, public pu publicity releases of the agencies who accused them. There was a nuclear espionage, and it was successful, but almost nothing was achieved by any spy chasers in the U.S., either to reveal the culprits or to punish them. Fuchs and Nunn may were real nuclear spies for the Soviet, but others, at least equally important, are hard, hardly ever mentioned. For example, Frédéric Joliot Curie, the greatest French nuclear physicist, Nobel Prize in 1935, and an admitted member of the Communist Party, knew a as much about the nuclear war work as anyone in Europe, Britain, or Canada. His chief associates have fled from France, he did not, in 1940, and worked on a nuclear project in England and Canada until they returned to France after that, uh, after that country's liberation. Some of these associates, notably Hans von Halben and Lou Kowarski, certainly knew as much as none may, and may have known as much as Fuchs, and unquestionably told all they knew to Juliette Curie, a communist, in 1944. Or again, as an example, a numerous unexplored past by which nuclear information was to Russia, 
went to Russia. An outstanding Polish nuclear physicist who studied with Jordan Curie was Ignace Zlo Zlato Zlatowski. He was in the United States in the critical years during the Soviet race to make the atom bomb as a member of the Polish embassy staff and Poland's representative on the UN Atomic Energy Commission. He sent large quantities of nuclear information behind the Iron Curtain and was present as an observer at the Bikini Bomb tests in 1946. Finally, it is evident that a great deal of nuclear information, whether secret or, or not, is unknown, as, as well as uranium metal, went to the Soviet Union as part of a Lend-Lease in 1943. Major George Racy Jordan, USAAF, tried in vain to disrupt these shipments at the time. While most of Jordan's evidence is unreliable, the shipment of uranium to Russia is corroborated uh, from other sources. The significance of such shipments is still unknown since the export license permitting them was granted at the request of General Groves. Jordan's other evidence, most of which was very discreditable to the New Deal, since he testified that he, Groves, and others were under direct pressure from Harry Hopkins and Vice President Henry Wallace to allow export of nuclear materials, radar, and other secrets to Russia, <clears throat> was subsequently shown to be false. Yet his, uh, yet all his statements were given nationwide uh, publicity by news commentators like Fulton Lewis Jr., by Life Magazine, and by the House Un-American Activities Committee, and are still widely believed. Most of the atomic spy cases are similar to these. The earliest of these was the arrest of Soviet Naval Lieutenant Rednan by the FBI on March 26, 1947, on charges that the Seattle Naval Engineer Herbert Kennedy had sold Rednan secrets about the Bikini Test ship Yellowstone for $250. This case was a forerunner of others in respect of two false assertions in new releases. One claims by the FBI that FBI that information leading to the Canada, uh, leading to the apprehension of Redland, had come from the Gozenko atomic spy case in Canada, February 1946. And two claims by the HUAC that it had unearthed this significant case. Redden was eventually acquitted when his defense showed that Kennedy had been paid for research he did not uh, he, he he did for Redden in the Seattle Public Library. Neither Gozenko nor HUAC had anything to do with it. The change in the climate of American opinion, and thus in the attitude of American juries over four years, may be observed in the contrast between the acquittal of Redland in 1946 and the conviction of Abraham Brothman in 1950. The FBI publicly and, and the universal uh, belief of uh, the American press, both at Brothman's arrest in July 1950 and at his trial in November 1950, November 1950 uh, was that he was part of the Soviet spy apparatus under a Russian trade organization chief working your ferret out atomic secrets <clears throat> the new york times july 30th 1950 or that the trial was an atomic spy case all new york newspaper headlines november 8th through, through 23rd 1950. in fact brothman and his secretary miss moskowitz were the only independents in the trial for conspiracy to persuade a third person not on trial harry gold to commit perjury in july 1947. undoubtedly brothman and his secretary had discussed together what they would do about the testimony to be given by the semi-moronic gold before the grand jury. Their, their purpose, in which they, cleared, they clearly failed, was to keep Brothman from being involved in any charges of giving secrets of communists to communists. Technically, technically they were guilty of conspiracy, were, found, were so found, and were sentenced to a total of nine years imprisonment. In spite of the fact that the trial clearly showed that Brothman had nothing to do with the espionage, secrets, or atomic research, uh, the mistaken impression that he was never removed by the press and remained in public mind as an established truth, so that the United States Attorney Irving Sapol, who pros prosecuted this case in November 1950, referred to Brothman as the convicted, as convicted of espionage when he prosecuted Rosenberg case uh, uh, before the same judge in April 1951. The true story, as far as Brothman was concerned, seems to be quite different. Brothman was an industrial chemist and chemical inventor who owned a number of chemical laboratories and factories held as subsidiaries of the Pennsylvania Sugar Company. His chief con concern was industrial solvents in which he held patents and processes and equipment. In 1940, when Brothman was seeking orders for his products, he was approached by a Russian, Jacob Golos, then proprietor of World Tourists, a communist front travel agency by previously employed... Uh, but previously empo employed by the Soviet Trade Commission, AMTORG, AMTORG, and its Purchasing Commission. Brothman of, of offered Golas 10% commission on any orders he could place with either agency for Brothman's products or processes. 
We know that we know now that uh, Golos was a high official in the Soviet secret police, a major Soviet spy, and one of the three men uh, control mission of the American C Communist Party. Brothman knew none of this and was not himself a communist, although in 1940 he regarded the Soviet Union as the chief obstacle to world fascism. For several months in 1940, Brothman gave to Golos, both directly and through Golos's mistress, Elizabeth Bentley, blueprints and descriptions of the chemical processes he had for sale. All of these were available to any prospective purchaser and had been written up and advertised by Brothman in the regular chemical journals, and many were his own inventions. When Brothman objected to talking to Golos or Miss Bentley on the ground that they knew no chemistry, Golos sent him another agent, a chemist, Harry Gold who had been doing industrial research, which gradually, gradually developed into industrial espionage for Amtorg for several years. Although Brothman got little or no business from the Russians, he hired Gold, Gold as a chemist in one of his laboratories in 1943. For years later, after Gold, unknown to Brothman, had become an atomic spy contact with Futches, Brothman discussed with his secretary how Gold's testimony before a grand jury might be given to prevent unfavorable inferences regarding Brothman's contacts with Golos in 1940. The view of the, cha of the changed American attitude towards such Russian contacts from 1940 to 1947 is not perhaps a surprising reaction, but in the increasing tense uh, situation of 1950, it won Brothman a seven-year prison sentence for conspiring with his secretary to persuade Gold to commit perjury. Gold was not tried either for the conspiracy or for perjury. <laughs> The, the, the changed atmosphere of the American public opinion from 1947 was greatly intensified with the increasingly, stra increasingly strained world conditions and by growing public knowledge of the nature of the communist movement into connections with Soviet Russia in their joint conspiracy against the West. Much of this evidence came from ex-communists such as Elizabeth Bentley, Louise Bud Budins, Whitaker Chambers, John Lautner, and others. All of, the, all of these undoubtedly were ex-communists and equally undoubtedly revealed much valuable information about the communist conspiracy and properly roused the American public to danger of this conspiracy. But it is equally true that the first three names mentioned are known and are remembered because they dramatized, distorted, and manipulated, consciously or unconsciously, evidence for their own private purposes. This is particularly true in Elizabeth Bentley and Louise Budden's <clears throat> both of whom exaggerated their previous roles in the Communist Party and were very ignorant of the real nature and significance of their own evidence, or of any evidence, and knew very little that was not based on a hearsay, often as at second or third hand, and undoubtedly embroidered, uh, embroidered and manipulated their evidence for their own for their private profit. But ends, who was managing the editor, really copy editor, of the communist newspaper, The Daily Worker, from 1941 to 45, carefully planned his withdrawal from the party to protect his own interests. His decision was made early in 1945. He arranged for a position on the faculty of Notre Dame University at the end of September, obtained his weekly pay in advance from The Daily Worker for the second week of October, left the paper in the party on October 11th, and joined the Notre Dame faculty two days later. In the next eight years, in addition to his salary, he received gross earnings, earnings of $70,000 as a professional ex-communist lecturer and writer. <laughs> this is certainly legitimate, but in obvious, it is obvious that Budins, in order to retain his value in the specialist, specialized market, had to continue to produce new evidence, if not new sensations. Much of this evidence, released over the years, became more and more remo remote from his personal knowledge or even from the facts. This is, for example, very clear in his efforts to show that the American foreign policy in China was controlled, determined, or influenced by persons who he called communists. Miss Bentley's profiting from her role of ex-communist was much less legitimate, as can be seen from one example. Early in 1950, when Miss Bentley's position was in money and reputation precarious, and her 18 month, months of successful notoriety as an informer seemed to be approaching eclipse, she signed a contract with Devin Adair for an autobiography to be written with the editorial assistance of John Bernini, who would also share in, his, in the royalties. At the time, a uh, libel suit against Miss Bentley by William Remington, who she called a communist, had been settled by an out-of-court payment of $90,000 to Remington on Miss Bentley's behalf by the radio network and the program sponsor for whom she had been the charge. She had made the charges. John Bernini, who was to share the profits of Miss Bentley's book, was foreman of the grand jury, which indicted Remington for perjury a few weeks later, May 50, 1950, for testifying he had not been a communist. The evidence that he was given before the grand jury, headed by Bernini, came from Miss Bentley. Perjury, however, required two witnesses. Bernini obtained the second witness by browbeating Miss Remington into a sta statement that her former husband had told her that he paid dues to the Communist Party. 
To obtain this corroboration from the former Miss Remington, Bernini threatened her with uh, contempt proceedings by making her believe, contrary to the truth, that the, uh, that the privilege against the use of a wife's evidence did not apply to her after her separation from Remington on J January 1947. This disgraceful procedure, which eventually led to Remington's conviction for perjury and to his death in prison by the hand of another prisoner, is indicative of Miss Bentley's attitude toward truth. To cover up her financial relationship with Bernini when she was preparing to cooperate with him in the indictment of Remington, the book contract was redrawn, omitting Bernini's name. This was done, apparently, as a consequence of statements of two employees of Devin Adair who knew the contract with Bernini's name. One was the woman who typed it. A new contract was drawn which did not contain Bernini's name, and the two employees left Devin Adair's employment. The book, published under the title Out of Bondage in 1951, pretended to be Miss Bentley's memoirs, but two years later, when an effort was made to use it against her in another judicial proceeding, she called it fiction. In addition to the distorting influence of profit, the story of the communist threat to the U.S. was also confused and manipulated for partisan motivations. When the wholesale revelations of ex-communists began in 1947, the New Deal and its successor had been in the White House for more than 14 years. The Republicans, especially the congressional delegations, were prepared to do almost anything to destroy the reputation of President Truman and the memory of Franklin Roosevelt in order to win the presidential election in 1948. They were offered a great opportunity to do so when Republicans won control of both House and Congress in the congressional elections of 1946. Both Houses of Congress, excuse me. This effort was spearheaded in 1947 and 48 by the House, House Committee on Un-American Activities, <clears throat> whose antics over previous years had already shown large-scale disregard of rules of good procedure, fair treatment, and unbiased investigation. The UAS, the HUAC in 1947 and 48 had nine members of which the chief were J. Parnell Thomas of New Jersey, Chairman Carl E. Munt of South Dakota, and Rich, Richard M. Nixon of California on the Republican side. The four Southern Democrats, led by John S. Wood of Georgia and John E. Rankin of Mississippi, on the Democratic side. The value of the publicity gained by the committee in these two years may be judged by the fact that it carried both Mund and Nixon to the Senate in 1948 and 50, and to the latter to the Vice Presidency and close to the Presidency itself in 1952 and 60. There could be no doubt that the Republican members of the committee realized the value of the publicity to be gained by membership on it, and that their actions were consistently aimed more at partisan advantage for themselves and the discrediting of previous Democratic incumbents in the White House than they were directed uh, to ascertaining the nature and functioning of the communist conspiracy in the U.S. after legislative committees occasionally copied these tactics. Other legislative committees occasionally copy these tactics. It was this partisan rather than investiga investigatory bias in, in the behavior of such committees, which reduced much of this investigation of communism into personal vendettas, such as those between Hiss and Chambers, between Remington and Bentley, and between Lightmore and Buddins. In these uh, battles of personalities, charges and countercharges flew about so freely at hearings in the press, over the airwaves, and occasionally in judicial proceedings that the truth cannot now be ascertained. There, there could be no doubt that the falsehood and even the perjury were to be found on both sides. What is equally regrettable is that the numerous other ac accused communists, both in government and out, whose names were given to these committees on the same basis, and sometimes in the same breath as Hiss, Remington, or Lattimore, were almost totally ignored and lost in the personal con controversies around uh, aroused over these three, largely because of the partisan handling of the investiga investigatory committees. These revelations began in January and February 1947, when Buttons identified Gerhard Eisler as the communist leader in the U.S. Within a few weeks, President Truman gave the investigators a prime weapon when he issued an order March 21st, 1947, requiring a loyalty oath from all government workers. The significance of this was that any communist in the government could be prosecuted for perjury unless they had admitted the fact. In the course of the summer, the FBI, FBI arrested a half a dozen individuals at various times and announced that they had stolen vital atomic uh, secrets from the heart of the atomic bomb project at Los Alamos. This alarming news was reinforced by a number of press releases from HUAC. When the accused were brought to trial, however, it developed that they had been guilty of insignificant and technical infractions of the law, such as taking snapshots of each other while serving as soldiers at Los Alamos, or pilfering of government property there. Eventually, two were, give, two were suspended, given suspended sentences. <clears throat> One was sentenced to 18 months, and four got six months. In. A fifth paid a fine at $250. The original charges of the atomic espionage were in headlines. The final disposition, yeah, dis disposition of the cases, if recorded at all, appeared in insignificant items on a back page, unconnected with atomic espionage. In February 1948, Representative Thomas, chairman of the U.A. 
HUAC was seeking uh, from the Congress the largest appropriations his committee had ever obtained. Apparently, to bolster this request, on the last day of the month from his hospital bed, he issued a six-page report on Dr. Edward U. Condon, director of the National Bureau of Standards. Condon, one of the world's greatest authorities in quantum mechanics, had been attacked by Thomas for about a year, chiefly in press releases and in two articles in national magazines, apparently because of the animosity over Condon's opposition to Johnson, Johnson May's bill for atomic energy control. The report of February 1948 said flatly, Dr. Condon is one of the weakest links in our atomic security. This charge was based on the mishmash of falsehoods or irrelevancies and incorrect inferences. It was charged that Condon had obtained his job from the favor of Henry Wallace, then Secretary of Commerce, with the implication that Condon must be a left-winger if Wallace was. In fact, Wallace did not even know Condon, and appointed him only for the administrative reason that the Bureau of Standards was a part of the Commerce Department. Or, again, the HUAC report quoted from a letter of J. Edgar Hoover to W. Averell Harriman when the latter was Secretary of Commerce in May 1947. This letter had been stolen from the FBI loyalty report of Condon and was merely a history of unevaluated reports of Condon's actions that were reported to the F FBI. As published in the UA UA uh, HUAC report, it was edited to cut out, without any indication, sentences favorable to Condon. It was charged that Condon's passport was taken up by the State Department when he planned to go to Russia in 1946. The fact was that this plan was a government-sponsored project to fly about two dozen American scientists to Russia in an Army plane, and Condon's participation was canceled by the Army because they regarded him as too valuable a nuclear scientist to be risked behind the Iron Curtain, where he might be kidnapped. The HUAC report said that Condon recruited members to join an organization lifted, listed as subversive by the Attorney General and the American Soviet Science Society. It later uh, developed that this organization, which existed for the purpose of translating scientific reports from Ru Russian to English, uh, issuing funds from the Rockefeller Foundation, had never been listed as subversive by the Attorney General, but on the contrary had been encouraged by the U.S. government as a method of finding out what the Russians were doing in science. The HUAC had simply confused this society with an entirely different organization, which the Attorney General had listed. On this kind of evidence, the HUAC demanded Condon's removal from the government and ominously reported that the situation as regards Dr. Conant is not an isolated one. There are other government officials in strategic positions who are playing Stalin's game to detriment of the United States. Conant's repeated requests for an opportunity to appear before the committee to refute its charges under oath were ignored. The committee, especially its chairman, continued to harass Conant so that it was impossible for him to do this work in the Bureau of Standards. This was done by subjecting him to the loyalty investigation after another. One, one loyalty investigation after another. Each takes a great deal of work by the FBI and, and the accused and requires months. These investigations, one after the other, cleared Dr. Condon, but each cleared was followed by new charges and a new investigation. After a fourth clearance and opening a fifth investigation, Condon resigned from the government in 1954. This fifth in investigation was demanded by Vice President Nixon, who seems to have felt that th his organization participated in the unjustified smearing of Condon six years before it had to be sustained by continued persecution. By that time, Chairman Thomas, who was the director of the persecution in 1947-49, had been sent to prison as a common criminal for making the employees in his congressional office, paid from government funds, secretly give back substantial parts of their salaries to him. Thomas should have restricted his efforts for additional money to smearing innocent scientists and paid articles in national magazines. The, Con the Condon case was still in its early full publicity in July and August 1948 when the Thomas Committee hit the headlines for weeks, day after day, with the testimony of Louise Budins, Elizabeth Bentley, Whitaker Chambers, and other experts on communists. They listed several dozen names of communists in government in the 1930s, organized in formal groups of s or cells, and generally paying dues and sending information through couriers like Miss Bentley. Most of those named ignored the charges or simply made a denial to the press, but few, such as Hiss, who sought to refute the charges were met by new, new ones. Eventually, as we have seen, Remington and Hiss were both jailed for perjury, the former for denying he had been a communist, and the latter for denying he, had, he gave government documents to Chambers. Both gave requests to trial before convictions were obtained. Others of these named were called before the committee and refused to give evidence under the Fifth Amendment to the Const Constitution, which protects against self-incrimination. <laughs> Little was done about these, but it is clear that many of them were in fact communists and that Bentley and Chambers knew them as such, but he by hearsay at least. Bentley's original evidence in 1948 gave a score of names of communists she had known. 
in the government. More than two years passed before it became, it became clear that she did not know them all, had never met them, and could not identify them by sight, but had merely gathered their names from her contacts with a few communist, communists who reported directly to her and whom she knew well. Similarly, uh, she indicated in her original evidence that she had broke with the communists and went to the FBI for patriotic reasons in August 1945. Only in 1953, when the Eisenhower administration was still trying to make a major issue of the communists in, in the New Deal, did Attorney General Brownell, in publishing a letter of J. Edgar Hoover, inadvertently revealed that Miss Bentley's revelations to it did not begin until November 8, 1945, the day after the newspapers revealed that Buttons had been giving names. Miss Bentley's earlier visit to the FBI in New Haven in August 1945 had nothing to do with her desire to give information or with communists but was simply a desire to find out if a man who had dated her was an employee of the FBI. The most sensational evidence from the HUAC was released in the late summer of 1948, just in time to influence the presidential election in November. Apparently, it did not have the influence expected since Truman was elected. The controversy from its revelations continued for years, and the charges, both from HUAC and from other sources, increased in violence. Few of the revelations of 1948 uh, were ever sustained in court. For example, two separate atomic espionage cases involving Clarence F. Hiskey at Argonne Laboratory in Chicago and Joseph W. Weinberg at Berkeley Radi Radiation Laboratory were played up by HUAC in 1949. Eventually, Hiskey refused to answer questions before HUAC uh, was prosecuted for contempt and was acquitted in 1951. Weinberg, accused by HUAC of giving atomic secrets to a well-known communist Stephen Nelson eventually was prosecuted for perjury at the committee's insist insistence and was acquitted in 1953. Both scientists found their careers injured by the committee's charges. There were many similar cases. The revelation of communist influence in the U.S. was undoubtedly valuable, but the cost in damaging the, to, uh, damage to the reputations of innocent persons and in the total confusion of the American people was a very high and largely unnecessary cost. Eventually, some agencies of the government, such as the Bureau of Standards, in the Army, and above all, the State Department, were severely injured by the loss of morale, disruption of work, and refusal of valuable personnel to work for the government under such conditions. Much of this damage came from the efforts of Senator Joseph R. McCarthy, Republican of Wisconsin, to prove that the State Department and the Army were widely infiltrated with communists and from the efforts of the neo-isolationists in the China lobby had to demonstrate that the Mao conquest of China was entirely due to the treasonable acts of communists and fellow travelers in the State Department in the White House. McCarthy was not a conservative, still less a reactionary. He, he was fragment, a fragment of elemental force, a throwback to primeval chaos. Uh, he was uh, the enemy of all order and all authority, with no respect or even understanding for principles, laws, regulations, or rules. As such, he had nothing to do with rational or generality, rationality or generality. Concepts, logic, distinctions of categories were completely, completely outside his world. It is, for example, perfectly clear that he did not have any idea what the communist, what a communist was, still less of communism is his, his itself, and he did not care. This is simply a term he used in the game of personal power. Most of the terms which have been applied to him, such as truculent, brutal, ignorant, sadistic, foul-mouthed, and brash, are quite correct, but not quite in the sense that his enemies applied them, because they assumed that these qualities and distinctions meant had, had a meaning in his world as they did in their own. They did not, because his behavior was all an act. The things he did to gain the experience he wanted, that is, the feeling of power, of creating fear, of destroying the roles, and of winning attention and admiration for doing so. His act was that of a peck, a peck's bad boy, but on a colossal scale, as the total rejection of everything he had come from in his first 20 years of life. He sought fame and acclaim by showing an admiring world of schoolmates what a tough guy he was, defying all the rules, even the rules of decency and ordinary civilized behavior. But like a bad boy of the schoolyard, he had no conception of time or anything established, and once he had found this act, it was necessary to demonstrate it every day. His thirst for power, the power of mass acclaim and publicity, reached the public scene at the same moment as television, and he was the first to realize what could be done by using the new instrument for reaching millions. His thirst for power was insatiable because, like hun hunger, it was a daily need. It had nothing to do with the power of authority or re regulated discipline, discipline, but the personal power of a sadist. All his destructive instincts were against anything established. The wealthy, the educated, the well-mannered, the roles of the Senate, the American party system, the roles of fair play. As such, he had no conception of truth or distinction between it and falsehood, just as he had no conception of yesterday, today, tomorrow, or distinct entities. 
he simply said whatever would satisfy momentarily his yearning to be the center stage surrounding surrounded by admiring fearful shocked amazed people he did not even care if the reaction was admiration fear shock or amazement and he did not care if they as persons had the same reaction or different one the next day or even a moment later he was exactly like an actor in drama one in which he made the script as he went along full of falsehoods and inconsistencies and he was genuinely surprised and hurt if a person whom he had abused and insulted for hours at a hearing did not walk out with him to a bar or even to a dinner the moment the hearing session was over he knew it was an act. He, he expected you to know it was an act. There was really no hypocrisy about it, no cynicism, no falsehood, as, as far as he was concerned, because he was convinced that this was the way the world was. Everyone, everyone he was convinced, had a, had a racket. This just happened to be his, and he expected people to realize this and understand it. Of course, to the observant outsider who did not share his total amorality, it was a false invented as he went along and constantly changed everything substantial substantiated by documents pulled from his bulging briefcase and waved about too rapidly to be read mostly these documents had nothing to do with what he was saying mostly he had never looked at them as himself they were merely props for the performance and to him it was a sil it was silly for his audience to expect such documents to be relevant as it would be for the audience in a theater to expect food that is being eaten the whiskey that's being drunk or the documents which are read in that play to be relevant to what the actor is saying like any actor who might be charged with inconsistency or lying because what he says is one play is not compatible with what he says in another play, McCarthy was puzzled, offended, hurt, or amused. With him, every day, every hour, was a different play. As a result, to the audience, nothing was consistent with anything else. He gave several different dates for his birth, and after 1945, never the correct one, November 14, 1908. Every time he spoke or wrote of his war experiences, the story was a different one, and with each version he became a larger, more nonchalant hero. Eventually, in 1952, when his power in Washington was at its height, and the most of the government feared to draw his wrath, or even his attention, he intimidated the Air Force into awarding him the Distinguished Flying Cross, given for 25 combat missions, although he had been a grounded intelligence officer who took occasional rides in planes. Since the laws and regulations were, for McCarthy, non-existent, his business and financial affairs are, like his, his life, a chaos of illegalities. From 1935 to 42, his gross income was less than $25,000, yet during the seven years he put more than twice that into the stock market. When he, when he was elected judge in 1939, one of the earliest decisions was appealed by the state to its Supreme Court, where it was found that McCarthy had destroyed those portions of the record in which he had justified dismissing the state's complaints. Shortly after he arrived in Washington as a new senator in 1947, he heard of Pepsi-Cola's difficulties with sugar rationing, accepted a $10,000 unsecured loan from Pepsi-Cola's lobbyist, and the next day opened an attack on sugar rationing. When this attack was successful, the same lobbyist endorsed a note for $20,000 which McCarthy used to cover his overextended bank account in Wisconsin. A year later, at the most active member of a joint congressional committee on the housing, he gutted the public housing features out of the Taft uh, Elender Wagoner house, housing bill in return for a thousand, thousands of dollars in favors from the private housing lobby. One of these favors was $10,000 from Lustring Corporation in return for putting his name as author on one of its publicity releases. And so it went, most of his ill-gotten gains being dissipated on horse racing bets, gambling, or partying parties with his friends. When the Senate subcommittee on privileges and elections elections late 1951 began to study one of his uh, bank accounts it found unexplained deposits of almost $173,000 and others almost $97,000 funneled through the administrative assistant in his office until early 1950 communism uh, meant little to McCarthy he had been elected to senate over the incumbent La Follette in 1946 as a result of communist controlled votes in the labor unions at Milwaukee as senator, he collaborated in a joint Nazi and communist plot to injure the United States and its army by reversing the convictions of German SS troops for atrocities committed on American prisoners of war captured in the Battle of the Bulge. But by January 1950, McCarthy was looking for an issue to be used for his re-election in 1952. At dinner with three men, two of them associates of mine, in the Colony Restaurant in Washington, January 7, 1950, he asked what issue should, he should use. After several suggestions, he seized upon communism. That's it, he said. The government is full of communists. We can hammer away at them. And to obtain an audience with his with his hammering, he requested bookings for Lincoln's birthday speeches from the Senate Republican Campaign Committee and was given assignments at Wheeling, West Virginia, 
Salt Lake City in Reno without any real conception of what he was doing and without any research or knowledge of the subject at Wheeling on February 9th. McCarthy waved a piece of paper, a copy of a four-year-old letter, a letter from uh, Burns to the representative Adolf Sabath and said, well, I cannot take the time to name all the men on the State Department who have been names and members of the Communist Party and members of, spying, of the spy ring. I have here in my hand a list of 205 that were well known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party and who nevertheless are still working in shaping the policy of the State Department. <coughs> the letter, in fact, uh, named no names and had nothing to do with spying or even communists, but simply reported that 3,000 employees of abolished war agencies who were being shifted to the State Department budget had been screened and 284 had been listed as undesirable. Of, of which 79 had been already separated from service, 26 of these because they were aliens. Every time McCarthy repeated the charge, the numbers of the categories changed. For example, the following night, he told his Salt Lake City audience, Last night, I stated that I had uh, names of 57 card-carrying members of the Communist Party. Out of the controversies raised by these charges, emergency uh, charges uh, emerged uh, McCarthy, the accuser, known to every American and praised or reviled by mil millions. <coughs> he, he loved it. On February 20th, in an in incoherent speech of more than six hours in the Senate, he announced that he had penetrated Truman's Iron Curtain of secrecy and that he was going to give 81 cases ident identified by numbers without names. <coughs> what ensued next, uh, six hours of bedlam as case after case was presented filled with contradictions and irrelevancies. There were 81 numbers, but only 66 cases for cases were left out. Some were repeated with different numbers. Many had never been employed by the State Department or even by the government. And one, primarily a morals case, had been discharged from it because he was an anti-communist. While another, Case 72, was a high type of man, a Democratic American who opposed communism. It was, according to the Senate Republican leader, Senator Taft, a perfectly reckless performance. Nevertheless, Taft and his colleagues determined to accept and support these charges since they would injure the administration. Accordingly, Taft uh, told McCarthy, if one of these cases doesn't work, try another. The public informed uh, only of the charges without the cynical details uh, gathered from the newspaper headlines that the State Department was full of communist spies. Even today, a few people realize that McCarthy, in five years of accusations, never turned up a communist in the State Department, although undoubtedly uh, there must have been some there. McCarthy repeated this performance before a Senate subcommittee chaired by Senator Millard Tidings of Maryland a few weeks later. From March 7th through early July, the subcommittee of the Senate Foreign Relations Com Committee uh, took 1,500 uh, printed pages of testimony, plus more than 1,000 pages of documentation. McCarthy's ten testimony soon developed based entirely on evidence turned up by the House of Representatives committees of the previous Congress. He gave names to 66 cases. He called it 81 cases. He had mentioned in his Senate speech in 35 new names. In few cases, were there any evidence? When asked for evidence, he eerily told Senator Tidings that that was his job. The evidence was in the State Department, and it was up to the committee to get it. After the, filing, after the files in question were obtained by the committee and found to contain no evidence to support McCarthy's charges, McCarthy called them phony files and insisted they had been raped and rifled of the FBI reports which had been, been in them. J. Edgar Hoover was called in, had the files examined, and reported that the, statement, the State Department files were intact. McCarthy ignored this rebuff. New charges followed. Eventually, he announced that he would base his whole reputation on one case. For more than a week, he tantalized the world in the committee with, by withholding the name the top Russian espionage agent in the United States. Algar has his boss in the espionage ring in the State Department. And the, the chief arch architect of the Far East Eastern Policy. At, the same, at last, the name was released. Professor Owen Lattimore of the John Hopkins University, the English-speaking world's greatest authority on Mongolia. The only trouble was that Lattimore was not a communist, not a spy, not an employee of the State Department. The Tidings Subcommittee uh, report issued in July condemned McCarthy for a fraud and, and a hoax on, this, on the Senate. On the Senate, um, 
start, they said, starting with nothing, Senator McCarthy plunged headlong forward desperately seeking to develop some information. McCarthy should have finished. He was not, and for a very simple reason. In politics, truth is not important, it's power. And McCarthy soon showed that he had the power, the power of an inflamed and misled public opinion. In the election in November 1950, several members of the Senate who had been most outspoken against McCarthy, including some of the most influential leaders of that august body, were defeated by McCarthyism, if not by McCarthy. Tidings was beaten in Maryland in 1950, and Scott Lucas, the Democratic leader in the Senate who had harassed, harassed McCarthy during his performance on uh, February 20th, went down with him. William Bennington, uh, Benton, a senator from Connecticut who introduced a resolution to expel McCarthy from the Senate in 1951, and whose charges were fully supported by the Senate's investigation of McCarthy's private finances, was defeated in 1952. With him went down uh, to defeat Lucas's successor as Democratic leader, Senator McFarland of Arizona. From 1950 to 54, most of his fellow senators and many in the executive branch were terrorized by McCarthy's power with the electorate and opposed him on nothing uh, they could possibly concede. During this period, he violated more laws and regulations than any previous senator in history. Thousands of his secret supporters in the administration sent him information and misinformation classified secrets, spite letters, anonymous notes. The Eisenhower administration at one time considered charging McCarthy himself with espionage, but did not have the courage. Much of this material was read by McCarthy over nationwide television broadcasts. When a report once said to him, isn't that a classified document? McCarthy said, it was, I just declassified it. <clears throat> it may be doubted that McCarthy's power to defeat his enemies was as great as he thought, but he encouraged these thoughts. Certainly he defeated tidings. Senator Tidings, from an old and wealthy Maryland family with a brilliant combat record in World War I, was too conservative for Franklin Roosevelt, who tried to purge him in the primary campaign in 1938, but had been soundly rebuffed. McCarthy did it differently, using the large sums of money which came to him from real anti-communists through, throughout the country. McCarthy hired a group of shady characters led by an ex-FBI agent, fired for immora immorality during enforcement of the man-white slave law, and sent them, well equipped with funds, into Maryland, into Maryland to fight tidings as a pro-communist. The state election laws were violated on a wholesale basis, including uh, excess expenditures, forgery, the use of out-of-date out of paid campaigners, and numerous other violations. The coup de grace was administered to tidings by wide circulation of a faked photograph of tidings and communist leader Earl Browder cozily together, a concoction of McCarthy's staff. After Tidings was defeated, several of his, of his victorious opponent's st staff, including his campaign manager, were, were tried and sentenced to jail or to pay fines for electoral vo law violations, but that did not change the result of the election. Uh, a few other senators wanted to risk the same ordeal by opposing McCarthy in the Senate. The Republicans were, were as scared as the Democrats, and with good reason, for, for party lines, like all other distinctions, meant nothing to McCarthy, and he continued his charges in 1953-54 to 54 with his own party in control of both houses of Congress and Eisenhower in the White House. The, the chief change was that he stopped talking of 20 years of treason in the White House and talked of 20 years, uh, 21 years of treason. The new president, in an effort to divert these attacks, continued to yield to him as he had yielded to him during the campaign. The administration was soon boasting that 1,456 federal workers had been separated in the first four months of the Eisenhower security program. At the end of the first year, uh, the president raised this total to 2,200. It took some weeks for Democrats to discover that these figures did not apply to subversives or even to security risks, but to anyone who left the government service. By the end of its year, its first year, the new administration adopted completely McCarthy's refusal to be hampered by categories. Vice President Nixon said, We're kicking the communists and fellow travelers and security risks out, out of the government by the thousands. It was soon clear that n no known communists were kicked out and that the security risks included all kinds of persons, such as those who imbibed too freely at Washington's endless cocktail parties. A communist in the State Department would have been a prize among this motley group, but no one was announced. For a while, the new administration tried to outdo McCarthy, chiefly by demonstrating in committee hearings that China had been lost to the communists because of the careful planning 
<clears throat> an intrigue of communists in the State Department. The, the chief effort in this direction was uh, done by a well-organized and well-financed China lobby, radiating from the activities of Alfred Kohlberg, a wealthy exporter who had had business interests in China. This group, with its allies, such as McCarthy, mobilized a good deal of evidence that communists had infiltrated in, into various academic, journalist, journalistic, and research groups concerned with the Far East, but they failed to prove their contention that a conspiracy of these communists and fellow travelers acting through the State Department had given China to Mao. Mao won out in China because of the incompetence and corruption of the Chiang Kai-shek regime, and he won out in spite of any aid to the U U.S. Uh, United States gave, or could give, to Chiang because the latter regime was incapable of holding out against Mao without drastic reforms, whatever the scale of American aid. Without American uh, military intervention to make war on Mao, which would which uh, very few desired. The Chinese lobby lobby's versions uh, was based on two contentions. One, that there were communists in significant positions close to the agencies which helped to form American academic and public opinion on the Far East, and two, that there were frequent agreements between known communists and known formulators of American policy and opinion on China. This whole subject is too complex for adequate discussion here, but the situation may, must be outlined. There is considerable truth in the China lobby's contention that the American experts on China were organized into a single interlocking group which had a general consensus of a leftish character. It is also true that this group, uh, from its control of funds, academic recommendations, and research or publication opportunities, could favor persons who accepted the established consensus and could injure, finally, or in, professionally, in, in professional advancement, persons who did not accept it. It is also true that the established group, by its influence on book reviewing and the New York Times, the Herald Tribune, the Saturday Review, a few magazines, including the liberal weeklies, and in the professional journals, uh, could advance or hamper any specialist's career. It is also true that these things were done in the U.S. in regard to the Far East uh, by the Institute of Pacific Relations. That is, organi organization had been infiltrated by communists, and by communist sympathizers, and that much of this group's influence arose for, from its access to a control over the flow of funds from financial foundations to scholarly activities. <clears throat> All these things were true, but they would have been true of many other areas of American scholarly research and academic administration in the U.S., such as Near East studies or anthropology or educational theory or political science. They were more obvious in regard to the Far East because of the few persons and the, the bigger issues involved in that area. On the other hand, the charges of the China lobby, accepted and proliferated by the neo-isolationists in, in the 1950s and by the radical right in the 1960s, that China was lost because of this group or that the members of this group were disloyal to the United States or engaged in espionage or were participants in a conscious plot or that the whole group was controlled by Soviet, Soviet agents or even by communists is not true. Yet the whole subject is of major importance in understanding the 20th century. In the first place, because of the language barriers, the number of people could be, who could be experts on the Far East was limited. Most of these, like Pearl Buck, Professor Fairbank of Harvard, or Professors Latourette and Rowe of Yale, and many others, were children or relatives of people who originally became concerned with China as missionaries. This gave them a double character. They learned the language, and they had a feeling of spiritual mission about China. When we add this to... Add to this that they were, until after 1950, few in numbers and had access because of the commercial importance of the Far East to relatively large amounts of research, travel, and publication funds on Far East matters. They almost inevitably came to form a small group who knew each other personally, met fairly regularly, had fairly established consensus based on conversations and reading each other's books on Far East questions and, and generally had certain characteristics of a clique. Lattimore, for example, because he knew Mongolian and the others did not, tended to be, become everybody's expert on Mongolia, was rarely challenged on Mongolia or northwest interior China, and inevitably became rather opinionated, if not conceited, on the subject. Moreover, many of these experts and those 
the ones which were favored by the Far East establishment and the Institute of Pacific Relations, were captured by communist ideology. Under its influence, they propagandized as experts erroneous ideas and sought to influence policy in mistaken directions. For example, they sought to establish in 1943 through 50 that the Chinese communists uh, were simple agrarian reformers, rather, rather like the third party groups of the American Mid Midwest, or that Japan was evil and must be crushed, the monarchy removed, and later that American policy in Japan under General MacArthur was a failure. They even accepted on occasion the Stalinist line that communist regimes were democratic and peace-loving, while capitalist ones were warlike and aggressive. For example, as late as 1951, the John Day Company, Richard J. Walsh president, published an indictment of MacArthur's policies in Japan by Robert Texter. The book, called Failure in Japan, had an introduction by Lattimore and sought to show that our occupation policy led to failure for more Failure for democratic values in Japan and a situation of strategic weakness for the West. This childish libel was propagated by the IPR, which mailed out 2,300 postcards advertising the book. Behind this unfortunate situation lies another, more profound relationship which influences matters much broader than the Far Eastern policy. It involves the organization of tax-exempt fortunes of international financiers into foundations to be used for educational, scientific, and other public purposes. Sixty or more years ago, public life in the West was more dominated by the influence of Wall Street. This term has nothing to do with its use by the communists to mean monopolistic industrialism. But on the contrary, <clears throat> contrary, refers to international financial capitalism deeply involved in the gold standard, foreign exchange fluctuations, floating of fixed interest securities, and to a lesser extent, flotation of industrial shares for stock exchange markets. This group, which in the United States was completely dominated by J.P. Morgan and Company from the 1880s to 1930s, was cosmopolitan, anglophile, internationalist, Ivy League, Eastern Seaboard, High Episcopalian, and European culture conscious. Their connection with the Ivy League colleges rested on, on the fact that the large endowments of these institutions required constant consultation with the financiers of Wall Street, or its lesser branches on State Street, Boston, and elsewhere, and, and was reflected in the fact that these endowments, even in 1930, were largely in bonds rather than in real estate or common stocks. As a consequence of these influences, as late as the 1930s, J.P. Morgan and his associates were the most significant figures in pol policy making in Harvard, Columbia, and to a lesser extent Yale, while the Whitney's were significant at Yale. And the Pruden Prudential Insurance Company, through Edward D. Duffield, dominated Princeton. The names of these Wall Street illuminaries uh, still adorn these Ivy League campuses with Harkness Colleges and a Payne Whitney Gymnasium at Yale, a Pine Dormitory at Princeton, a Dillon Field House, in, and Lamont Library at Harvard. The chief officials of these universities were beholden to these financial powers and usually owed their jobs to them. Morgan himself helped make Nicholas Murray Butler president of Columbia, his chief, his chief Boston agent. Uh, Thomas Nelson Perkins of the First National Bank of that city gave, a co gave Conant his boost from the chemical laboratory to University Hall at Harvard. Uh, Duffield of Prudential caught unprepared when the un incumbent president of Princeton was killed in an automobile in 1932, made himself president for a year before he chose Harold Dodds for the post of in 1933. At Yale, Thomas Lamont, managing partner of the Morgan firm, was able to swing Charles Seymour into the presidency of that university in 1937. The significant influence of Wall Street, meaning Morgan, both in the Ivy League and in Washington, in a period of 60 or more years following 1880, explains the constant interchange between the Ivy League and the federal government, an in interchange which undoubtedly uh, aroused a good deal of resentment in less favored circles who were more than satiated with accents, tweeds, and high Episcopal Anglophilia of these peoples. Poor Dean Atkinson, in spite of, or perhaps because of, his remarkable qualities of intellect and character, took the full brunt of his, this resentment from McCarthy and his allies in 1948 through 54. The same feeling did no good to pseudo-Ivy League figures like Alger Hiss, 
because of its dominant position in Wall Street, the Morgan firm came in also to dominate other Wall Street powers such as Carnegie, Whitney, Vanderbilt, Brown Harriman, or Dylan Reed. Close alliances were made with Rockefeller, Mellon, and Duke interests, but not nearly so intimate ones with the great industrial powers like DuPont and Ford. In the spite of the great influence of this Wall Street alignment, an influence great enough to merit the name of the American establishment, this group could not control the federal government and, in consequence, had to adjust to a good many government actions thoroughly distasteful to the group. The chief of these were in taxation law, beginning with the graduated income tax in 1913, but culminating, above all else, in the inheritance tax. These tax laws drove the great private fortunes dominated, dominated by Wall Street into tax-exempt foundations, which became a major link in the establish, establishment network between Wall Street, the Ivy League, and the federal government. Dean Rusk, Secretary of State after 1961, form, formerly president of the Rockefeller Foundation and Rhodes Scholar Oxford, 1931 through 33, is a much um, a member of this nexus as Alger Hess, the Dulles brothers, Jerome Green, James T. Shotwell, John W. Davis, Elihu Root, or Philip Jessup. More than 50 years ago, the Morgan firm decided to infiltrate the left-wing political movements in the U.S. This is relatively easy to do. Since these groups were starved for funds and eager for a voice to reach the people, Wall Street supplied both. The purpose was not to destroy, dominate, or take over, but was really threefold. One, to keep informed about the thinking of left-wing or liberal groups. Two, to provide them with a mouthpiece so that they could blow off steam. And three, to have a final veto on their publicity and possibly on their actions if they ever went radical. There was nothing really new about this decision, since other financiers had talked about it and even attempted it earlier. <clears throat> what made it decisively important this time was the combination of its adoption by the dominant Wall Street financier. At a time when a tax policy was driving all financiers to seek tax-exempt re refuges for their fortunes, and at a time when the ultimate uh, in left-wing radicalism was about to appear under the banner of the Third International. The best example of this alliance of Wall Street and the left-wing publication was The New Republic, a magazine founded by Willard Strait using Payne Whitney money in 1914. Strait, who had been assistant to Sir Robert Hart, director of the Chinese Imperial Customs Service and the head of the European imperialist penetration of China, and had remained in the Far East from 1901 to 1912, became a Morgan partner and the firm's chief expert on the Far East. He married Dorothy, Dorothy Payne Whitney, whose names indicate the family alliance of two of America's greatest fortunes. She was the daughter of Willie, William C. Whitney, New York utility millionaire, and the sister and co-heiress of Oliver Payne of the Standard Oil Trust. One of her brothers married Gertrude Vanderbilt, while the other, Payne Whitney, married the daughter of Secretary of State John Hay, who enunciated the American policy of the open door in China. In the next generation, three first cousins, John Hay, Jock, Whitney, Cornelius Vanderbilt, Sonny, uh, Whitney, and Michael Whitney, Mike, Strait, were allied in numerous public policy enterprises of a propagandist nature, and all three served in various roles in the late New Deal and Truman administrations. And these, they were closely allied with other Wall Street liberals, such as Nelson Rockefeller. The New Republic was founded by Willard and Dorothy Strait using her money in 1914 and continued to be supported by her financial contributions until March 23, 1953. The original purpose for establishing the paper was to provide an outlet for the progressive left and to guide it quietly in an Anglophile direction. This latter task was entrusted to a young man, only four years out of Harvard, but already a member of the mysterious Round Table Group which has played a major role in directing England's foreign policy since its form formal establishment in 1909. This new recruit, Walter Lippmann, has been, from 1914 to the present, the authentic spokesman in American journalism for the establishments on both sides of the Atlantic and international affairs. His bi-weekly columns, which appear in hundreds of American papers, are copyrighted by the New York Herald Tribune, which is now owned by J.H. Whitney.
it was these connections as link as a link between Wall Street and the Round Table Group, which gave Lippmann the opportunity in 1918, while still in his 20s, to be the official interpreter of the meaning of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points to the British government. Willard Strait, like many Morgan agents, was present at the Paris Peace Conference, but died there of pneumonia before it began. <clears throat> Six years later, in 1925, when his widow married a second time and became Lady Elmhurst of Darlington Hall, she took her three small children from America to England, where they were brought up as English. She herself renounced her American citizenship in 1935. Shortly afterward, her young son, her younger son, Mike, unsuccessfully stood for Parliament on the Labour Party ticket for the constituency of Cambridge University, an act which required, under law, that he be a British subject. This proved no obstacle. In 1938, when Mike, aged 22, returned to the United States after 13 years in England, and, and at once was uh, appointed to the State Department as advisor on international economic affairs. In 1937, apparently in pre preparation for her son's return to America, Lady Elmhurst, sole, sole owner of the New Republic, shifted this ownership to West, West Rim Limited, a dummy corporation created for the purpose in Montreal, Canada, and set up in New York with a grant of $1.5 The William C. Whitney Foundation, on which Mike became president, this helped finance the family's interest in modern art and dramatic theater, including sister Beatrix's tours as a Shakespearean actress. Mike Strait served in the Air Force in 1943 through 1945, but this did not in any way hamper his career with the New Republic. He became Washington correspondent in May 1941, editor in June 1943, and publisher, and, uh, publisher in December 1946, when he made Henry Wallace edi editor. During these shifts, he changed completely the control of the New Republic and its companion magazine, Asia, removing known liberals such as Robert Morris Lovett, Malcolm Cowley, and George Soule, centralizing the control and taking it into his own hands. This control by Whitney Money had, of course, always existed, but it had been in abeyance for the 25 years following Willard Strait's death. The first editor of the New Republic, the well-known liberal... Herbert Crowley was always aware of the situation. After 10 years in the job, he explained the relationship in the official biography of Willard Strait, which he wrote for a payment of $25,000. He said, Of course they, the Straits, could always withdraw their financial support if they ceased to approve of the policy of the paper, and in that event, it would go out of existence as a consequence of their disapproval. Crowley's biography uh, of Strait, published in 1924, makes perfectly clear that Strait was in no sense a liberal or a progressive, but was indeed a typical international banker, and that the New Republic was simply a medium for advancing certain designs of such international bankers, notably blunt, uh, notably, uh, notably to blunt the isolationism and the anti-British sentiments so prevalent among many American pro progressives while providing them with a vehicle for expression of their progressive views in literature, art, music, and social reform, and even domestic politics. In 1916, when the editorial board wanted to uh, support Wilson for a second term in the presidency, Willard Strait took two pages of the magazine to express his own support for Hughes. The chief achievement of the New Republic, however, in 1914-18, to 18, and again in 1938-48, to 48, was for interventionism in Europe in support of Great Britain. <clears throat> the role of Mike Strait in this situation in 1938 through 48 is clear. He took charge of this family thief, abolished the editorial board, and carried on his father's aims in close cooperation with the labor and left-wing groups in American politics. In these efforts, he was in close contact with his inherited Wall Street connections, especially his Whitney cousins and its certain family agents like Bruce Bliven, Milton C. Rose, and Richard J. Walsh. They, they handled a variety of enterprises, including publications, corporations, and foundations, which operated out of the law office of Baldwin, Todd, and Lefferts of 120 Broadway, New York City. And this nexus were the New, York, New Republic, Asia Theater Arts, the Museum of Modern Art, and others, all supported by a handful of foundations including the William C. Whitney Foundation, the Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney Foundation, the J.H. Whitney Foundation, and others. 
An interesting addition was made to these enterprises in 1947 when Strait founded a new magazine, the United Nations World, to be devoted to the support of the UN. Its owners of record were the New Republic itself, under its corporate name, Nelson Rockefeller, J.H. Whitney, Max Ascotti, an anti-fascist Italian who had married American wealth and used it to support a magazine of his own, The Reporter, and Beatrice S. Dolevitt. The last lady, Mike Strait's sister, made her husband, Luis Dolevitt, international editor of the new magazine. An, an important element in the Nexus was Asia Magazine, which had been established by Morgan Associates as the Journal of American Asiatic Society in 1898, had been closely associated with Willard Strait during his lifetime, and was owned outright by him from January 1917. In the 1930s, it was operated by the Whitneys by Richard J. Walsh and his wife, known to the world as Pearl Buck. Walsh, who acted as editor of Asia, was also president of the holding corporation of the New Republic for several years and president of the John Day Publishing Company. In 1942, after Nelson Rockefeller and Jock Whitney joined the government to take charge of American propaganda in Latin America in the office of the coordinator of Inter-American Inter Affairs, Asia Magazine changed its name to Asia and the Americas. In 1947, when Mike Strait began a drive to sell the United Nations, it was completely reorganized into the United Nations world. Mike Strait was deeply anti-communist, but he frequently was found associated with them, sometimes as a collaborator, frequently as an opponent. The opposition was seen most clearly in his efforts as one of the founders of the American Veterans Committee, AVC and its political sequel, The Americans for Democratic Action, ADA. The collaboration may be seen in Strait's fundamental role in Henry Wallace's third-party campaign for presidency in 1948. The relationship between Strait and the communists and pushing Wallace into his 1948 adventure may be misjudged very easily. The anti-communist right had a very simple explanation of it. Wallace and Strait were communists and hoped to elect Wallace president. Nothing could be further from the truth. All three, Strait, Wallace, and the Communists, joined in an attempt to mer merely as a means of defeating Truman. Strait was the chief force in getting the campaign started in 1947 and was largely instrumental in bringing some of the Communists into it. But when he had them all on board the Wallace train, he jumped off himself, leaving both Wallace and the Communists gliding swiftly without guidance or rope on the downhill track to oblivion. It was a brilliantly done piece of work. The communists wanted a third party in 1948 because it seemed the only way to beat Truman and destroy the Marshall Plan. They hated the president for the Truman Doctrine and his general opposition to the Soviet Union, but above all because he had prevented the post-war economic collapse and the American relapse into isolationism, both of which the communists had not only expected but critically needed. It was obvious to everyone that a two-party campaign in 1948 would give the vote of the right to the Republicans and the vote of the left to the Democrats, with a victory decided by where the division came in the center. In such a situation, neither Strait nor the Communists could influence the outcome in any way. But a third party on the left, by taking labor and other left-wing votes from Truman, could reduce the Democratic totals in the major states enough to throw those states and the election to the Republicans. Why Strait wanted to do this in critical months from September 1946 to April 48 is unknown. But he clearly changed his mind in spring of 1948, abandoning poor, naive Henry Wallace to the communists at that time. A possible explanation of these actions will be given later. What is clear is that Mike Strait had a great deal to do with Wallace in the autumn of 1946 when the former vice president broke with Truman and was fired from the cabinet. The break came over a Wallace speech, very critical of American policy toward Russia, given before a wildly biased pro-Soviet audience in Madison Square Garden on September 12, 1946. At the same time, I mean, at, at the time, Truman told reporters he had approved the speech before delivery, a version which Wallace still upholds. But if, within a few days, Secretary of State Byrnes forced the president to make a choice between him or Wallace, and the latter was dismissed from the cabinet. Out of the government, without a platform from which to address the public, Wallace's political future looked dim in the early autumn of 1946. 
Straight provided the platform by giving him his own editorial chair at the New Republic, announced October 12, 1946. For the next 15 months, Wallace, the Wallace campaign was a straight campaign. The latter supplied speechwriters, research assistants, editorial writers, office space, money, and the New Republic itself. Technically, Wallace was editor, but the magazine staff and expenditures steadily increased in directions which had little to do with the magazine and everything to do with Wallace's presidential campaign, although this effort was not announced to the public until a year later, in 1947. In the meantime, from the spring of 1947 onward, the communists came in. It would not be strictly true to say that the sh sh that straight brought them in, but I believe it is fair to say that he let them in. For example, one of the first to arrive was Lou Frank, Jr., brought in by straight, who later insisted that he did not realize that Frank was a communist. As a matter of fact, there was no evidence that Frank was a member of the Communist Party, but Strait knew exactly where Frank stood politically since they had engaged on opposite sides in a bitter struggle between communists and anti-communists for control of the ABC. In this, Frank had been a member of the Communist Caucus with ABC's National Planning Committee, as Strait told David A. Shannon in 1956, and followed every twist of the party line in this whole period. This party line became the pattern for Wallace's formal speeches, since Frank was his most important speechwriter over a period of 18 months from early 1947 to October 1948. More than this, Frank accompanied Wallace on his endless travels during this period. In the autumn of 1947, these three, Wallace, Frank, and Strait, made a trip to the Mediterranean and were given an audience together by the Pope on November 4, 1947. On his return from this journey, Wallace was a changed man. His mind was made up to return against, against Truman on a third-party ticket. The announcement was made public in the New Republic in December. <clears throat> Strait continued to work for Wallace for president, and the New Republic remained the center of the movement for almost four more months. But something had changed. While he was still working for Wallace as president and allowing the communists into the project, he was simultaneously doing two other th things working openly and desperately to prevent the new third party from campaigning on any level other than the presidential. By blocking everywhere, he could have communist efforts to run third party candidates for state or congressional offices in competition with the Democrats, much less publicly. He worked with his anti-communist friends in labor, veteran, and liberal groups to present, uh, prevent endorsement of the Wallace candidacy. As a consequence, the communists were destroyed and eventually driven out of such organizations, notably from the CIOPAC, the Great Political Alignment of Labor and Progressive Groups. As David Shannon wrote in The Decline of American Communism, 1959, the communists' support of Wallace shattered the left center coalition in the CIO. The communist unions, the Wallace movement, was the beginning of the end. The coalition began to dissolve almost immediately after Wallace's announcement. <clears throat> what this means is that Wallace's campaign to defeat Truman destroyed completely the remaining vestiges of popular front movement of the 1930s, and drove the communists out of the unions and all progressive political groups, and drove the communists' unions out of the labor movement of the country. This ended communism as a significant political force in the U.S., and the end was reached by December 1948, long before McCarthy or J. Edgar Hoover or the HUAC did their work. The men who achieved this feat were, were Wallace and Strait, although it is not completely clear, clear if they recognized what they were doing. During the winter of 1947 through 48, Lou Frank recognized that he was incapable of handling the complex issues raised in Wallace's many speeches. Accordingly, he joined a communist research group, <clears throat> which met in the Manhattan home of the wealthy Wall Street Red, Frederick Vanderbilt Field. The chief members of this group, probably all communists, were Victor Perlo and David Ramsey. This pair drew up for Wallace an attack on the Marshall Plan and an alternative communist plan for European Reconstruction, which was published in The New Republic on January 12, 1948, was presented by Wallace to the Marshall Plan hearings of the House for, uh, Affairs Committee on February 24th, but was subsequently repudiated by Strait. In the three months following Perlow article, Strait was busy sawing off the limb which Wallace now sat with the communists. 
He discharged uh, from the New Republic payroll all those who were working for the campaign rather than for the magazine. And the office on East 49th Street once again settled down to publishing a liberal weekly. <clears throat> In protest at this reversal, his managing editor, Ed Johnson, resigned. If Mike Strait planned to do what he did do to the communists in 1946 through 48, that is, to get them out of the progressive movements and unions, he pulled off the most skillful political coup in 20th century American politics. It is, it is not clear that he did plan it or intended it, uh, but as a very able and informed man, he must have had some motivation when he began in 1947, the effort which he knew might defeat Truman in 1948. While the evidence is not conclusive, there are hints that another more personal motive might have been involved, at least partly, in building up the Wallace threat to Truman's political future. It concerns the Whitney family interest in overseas airlines. The Whitney family were deeply involved in airlines. Sonny Whitney was the founder of the Pan American Airlines and chairman of its board of directors from its establishment in 1928 until he went to military service in 1941. Mike's brother, Air Commodore Whitney Willard Strait, CBE, was even more deeply involved in the British side. Big Brother Whitney, born in 1912, had been in civilian aviation in England from the age of 22 and by 1946 through 49 was not only director of the Midland Bank, one of the world's greatest financial institutions, but was also director of Rolls-Royce and of BOAC, as well as chairman of the board of directors of BEA, British European Airways. <clears throat> in the years following the end of the war, a violent struggle was going on within aviation circles and the U.S. government over the future of American transocean air services. Before the war, they had been a monopoly of Pan Am, now, at the end of the war, the struggle was over how the CAB would divide up this monopoly and what disposition would be made of the enormous Air Force investment in the overseas bases. Apparently, the White House was not cooperative in these matters at first, but late 1947, C.V. Whitney was made by presidential interim appointment assistant secretary of the new department of the Air Force and 18 months later after Truman's inauguration, was made Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Aeronautics. This was the most important post concerned with civil aviation in any federal department. The connection, if any, between these appointments and Mike Strait's original support and later abandonment of Wallace has never been revealed. <clears throat> the associations between Wall Street and the left, of which Mike Strait is a fair example, are really survivals of the of the associations between the Morgan Bank and the left. To Morgan, all political parties were simply organizations to be used, and the firm always was careful to keep a foot in all camps. Morgan himself, Dwight Morrow, and other partners were allied with the Republicans. Russell C. Leffingwell was allied with the Democrats. Grayson Murphy was allied with the extreme right, and Thomas W. Lamont was allied with the left. With the left. Like the Morgan interest in the libraries, museums, and art, its inability to distinguish between loyalty the, to the U.S. and loyalty to England, its recognition of the need for social work among the poor, the multipartisan political views of the Morgan firm and domestic politics went back to the original founder of the firm, George Peabody, 1795-1869. To this same semi-figure, uh, seminal figure may be attributed the use of tax-exempt foundations for controlling these activities, as may be observed in many parts of America to this day, and the use of Peabody foundations to support Peabody libraries and museums. Unfortunately, we do not have space here for this great and untold story, but it must be remembered that what we do say is part of a much larger picture. Our concern at this moment with the li links between Wall Street and the left, especially the communists. Here, the chief link was the Thomas W. Lamont family. This family was in many ways parallel to the Strait family. Tom Lamont had been brought in into the Morgan firm, as Strait was several years later, by Henry P. Davidson, a Morgan partner from 1909. Lamont became a partner in 1910, as Strait did in 1913. Each had a wife who became a patroness of leftish causes, 
and two sons, of which the elder was a conventional banker, and the younger was a left-wing sympathizer and sponsor. In fact, all the evidence would indicate that Tom Lamont was simply Morgan's apostle to the left in succession to Strait, a change made necessary by the latter's premature death in 1918. Both were financial supporters of the liberal publications. <clears throat> in Lamont's case, the Saturday Review of Lit Literature, which, supported, uh, which he supported th throughout the 1920s and 30s, and the New York Post, which he owned from 1918 to 24. <laughs> The chief evidence, however, can be found in the files of the HUAC, which sh show Tom Lamont, his wife Flora, and his son Corliss as sponsors and financial angels to almost a score of extreme left organizations, including the Communist Party itself. Among these, we need mention only two. One of these was a communist front organization, the Trade Union Services Incorporated of New York City, which in 1947 published 15 trade union papers for various CIO unions. Among its officers were Corliss Lamont, Frederick Vanderbilt Field, another link between Wall Street and communists. The latter was on the editorial boards of the official communist newspaper in New York, The Daily Worker, as well as its magazine, The New Masses, and was the chief link between the communists and the Institute of Pacific Relations in 1928 through 47. Corliss Lamont was the leading light in another communist organization, which started life in the 1920s as the friend, as the friends of the Soviet Union, but in 1943 was reorganized with Lamont as chairman of the board and chief incorporator as the National Council of American Soviet Friendship. During this whole period, over two decades, Corliss Lamont, with the full support of his parents, was one of the chief figures in fellow traveler circles and one of the chief spokesmen for the Soviet point of view, both in these organizations and also in the connections which came to him either as son of the most influential man in Wall Street or a professor of philosophy at Columbia University. His relationship with his parents may be reflected in a few events of this period. <laughs> In January 1946, Corliss Lamont was called before HUAC to give testimony on the National Council of American Soviet Friendship. He refused to produce records, was subpoenaed, refused, was charged with contempt to Congress, and was so cited by the House of Representatives on June 26, 1946. In the midst of this controversy, in May, Corliss Lamont and his mother, Miss Thomas Lamont, presented their valuable collection of the works of Spinoza to the Columbia University. The adverse publicity continued, yet when Thomas Lamont rewrote his will on January 6, 1948, Corliss Lamont remained in it as a co-heir to his father's fortune of scores of millions of dollars. <laughs> In 1951, the Subcommittee on Inter Internal Security of the Senate Judiciary Committee, the so-called McCarran Committee, sought to show that China had been lost to the Communists by the deliberate actions of a group of academic experts on the Far East and Communist fellow travelers who worked in that direction with uh, control and coordinated by the Institute of Pacific Relations. The influence of the Communists in IPR is well established, but the patronage of Wall Street is less well known. <laughs> the IPR was a private association of 10 independent national councils in 10 countries concerned with affairs in the Pacific. The headquarters of the IPR and of the American Council of IPR were both in New York and were closely associated on the interlocking basis. Each spent about $2.5 million over the quarter century from 1925 to 50, of which about half in each case came from the Carnegie Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation which were themselves interlocking groups controlled by an alliance of Morgan and Rockefeller interests in Wall Street. Much of the rest, especially of the American Council, came from firms close, closely allied to these two Wall Street interests, such as Standard Oil, International Telephone and Telegraph, International General Electric, the National City Bank, and the Chase National Bank. In each case, about 10% of income came from sales of publications and, of course, a certain amount came from ordinary members who paid 15 a year and received the periodicals of the IPR and its American Council, Pacific Affairs, and, and uh, Far Eastern Survey. The financial deficits which occurred each year were picked up by financial angels, almost all with close Wall Street connections. The chief identifiable con contributions here were about $60,000 from Frederick Vanderbilt Field over eight years, 
$14,700 from Thomas Lamont over 14 years, $800 from Corliss Lamont only after 1947, and $18,000 from a member of Lee Higginson in Boston, who seems to have been Jerome D. Green. In addition, large sums of money each year were directed to private individuals for research and travel expenses from similar sources, chiefly the great financial foundations. <clears throat> Most of these awards for work in the Far Eastern area required approval or recommendation from members of I IPR. Moreover, access to publication and recommendations to academic positions in the handful of great American universities concerned with the Far East required similar sponsorship. And finally, there can be little doubt that the consultant jobs on Far Eastern matters in the State Department or, or other government agencies were largely restricted to the IPR-approved people. The individuals who published, who had money, found jobs, were consulted, and who were appointed intermittently to government missions were those who were tolerant of the IPR line. The fact that all these lines of com communication passed through the Ivy League universities or their scattered equivalents west of the Appalachians, such as Chicago, Stanford, or California, unquestionably went back to Morgan's influence in handling large academic endowments. There could be little doubt that the more active academic members of IPR, the professors and publicists who became members of its governing, governing board, such as Owen Lattimore, Joseph P. Chamberlain, and Philip C. Jessup of Columbia, William W. Lockwood of Princeton, John K. Fairbank of Harvard, and others, and the administration staff, which became in time the most significant influence in its policies, developed an IPR party line. It is, furthermore, fairly clear that this IPR line had many points in common both with the Kremlin's par party line on the Far East and with the State Department's policy line in the same area. The interrelations among these, or the influence of one on another, is highly disputed. Certainly, no final conclusions can be drawn. Clearly, there were some communists, even party members involved, such as Frederick Vanderbilt Field, but it is much less clear that there was any disloyalty to the U.S. Furthermore, there was a great deal of intrigue both to help those who agreed with the IPR line and to influence the United States government policy in this direction, but there is no evidence of which I am aware of any explicit plot or conspiracy to direct American policy in a direction favorable either to the Soviet Union or to international communism. Efforts of the radical right to support their convictions about these last points undoubtedly did great, lasting, and unfair damage to the reputations and interests of many people. The true explanation of what happened is not yet completely known, and, as far as it is known, is too complicated to uh, elucidate here. It is, however, clear that many persons who were born in the period 1900 to 1920 and came to maturity in the period 1928 to 40 were so influenced by their experiences of war, depression, and insecurity that they adopted, more or less unconsciously, certain aspects of the communist ideology, such as the economic interpretation of history, the role of dualistic class struggle in human events, or the exploitative, uh, exploitative uh, inter interpretation of, uh, of the role of capital in the productive system and of the possessing groups in any society. Many of these ideas were nonsense, even in terms of their own experiences, but they were facile interpretive guides for people who, whatever their expert knowledge of their special areas, were lacking in total perspective on society as a whole or human experience as a whole. Moreover, many of these people felt an unconscious obligation to help the underdog. This favorable attitude toward the downtrodden and the oppressed was rooted in our Western Christian heritage, as especially in 19th century humanitarianism, and in other, in an older Christian idea that all persons are redeemable and will prove trustworthy if they are but trusted. This outlook was, for example, pre prevalent in that ubiquitous intriguer Lionel Curtis, who was the original guide and parent of the IPR and of many similar organizations. As children of missionaries, many of the organizers and members of the IPR obtained this spirit from their family background, along with their knowledge of Far Eastern languages, which made them experts. It must be confessed that the IPR had many of the marks of fellow traveler or communist captive organization, but this does not in any way mean that the radical right or the professional ex-communist version of those events is accurate. For example, Elizabeth Bentley, above all, Louise Budenz, testified before the McCarran Committee on the IPR. 
The latter identified almost every person associated with the organization as a communist or under communist discipline by his personal knowledge. In the most famous case, that of Owen, Owen Lattimore, Buttons's emphatic testimony that Lattimore was a communist and that his orders were issued by small communist party conclaves of Earl Browder, Buttons, F. V. Field, and others was totally refuted not only by direct contradictory testimony of Browder and Field, but by subsequent evidence from more reliable witness, witnesses and from Budems himself. Questioning eventually made it clear that Budems did not know Lattimore or his work or any of his books, including one which he quoted as uh, proof of Lattimore's adherence to the party line. Moreover, Budems gave direct testimony that the 1944 mission of, to China of Vice President Henry Wallace, accompanied by Lattimore and John Carter Vinson, a State Department expert on the Far East who has been accused of communism, drew up recommendation, recommendations which were pro-communist. This was shown to be the exact contrary of the truth and a mere figment of the Budins' active, active imagination. Budins testified that the replacement of General Stilwell, who was, was anti-Shang and relatively favorable to Mao, uh, by General Wedemeyer, who was the consequence of the influence of Lattimore and Vincent on Wallace. Joseph Alsop, who was president at all the discussions in question and drafted the recommendations, later testified that he himself was the author of all the pro-communist passages which Bodens attributed to Lattimore and that he himself had suggested the relatively pro-Shang General Wedemeyer as Stillwell's successor in order to block Wallace's suggestion of General Chenault for the position. The radical right version of these events, as written up by John T. Flynn, Frida Utley, and others, was even more remote from the truth than were Budenz's or Bentley's versions, although it had a tremendous impact on American opinion and American relations with other countries in the years 1947 to 55. This radical right fairy tale, which is now an accepted folk myth in many groups in America, pictured the recent history of the United States in regard to domestic reform and in foreign affairs as a well-organized plot by extreme left-wing elements operating from the White House itself and controlling all of the chief avenues of the publicity in the U.S. to destroy the American way of life, based on private enterprise, liaises, fair, and isolationism, in behalf of alien ideologies of Russian socialism and British cosmopolitanism. Or internationalism. This plot, if we are to believe the myth, worked through such avenues of publicity as the New York Times and the Herald Tribune, the Christian Science Monitor and the Washington Post, the Atlantic Monthly and Harper's Magazine, and had at its core the wild-eyed and bushy-haired theoreticians of so uh, socialist Harvard and the London School of Economics. It was determined to bring the U.S. into World War II on the side of England, Roosevelt's first love, and Soviet Russia, his second love, in order to destroy even finer element of American life, and as part of his, this consciously planned scheme, invited Japan to attack Pearl Harbor and destroy Chiang Kai-shek, all the while undermining America's real strength by excessive spending and unbalanced budgets. This myth, like all fables, does in fact have a modicum of truth. There does exist, and has existed for a generation, an international Anglophile network which operates to some extent in the way the radical right believes the communists act. In fact, this network, which we may identify as the round table groups, has no aversion to cooperating with the communists or any other groups, and frequently does so. I know of the operations of this network because I have studied it for 20 years and was permitted for two years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it or to most of its aims and have, for much of my life, been close to it and to many of its instruments. I have objected, both in the past and recently, to a few of its policies, notably to its belief that England was an Atlantic rather than a European power and must be allied or even federated with the United States and must remain isolated from Europe. But in general, my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown, and I believe its role in history is significant enough to be known. The round table groups have already been mentioned in this book several times, notably in connection with the formation of British Commonwealth in Chapter 4 and in the discussion of appeasement in Chapter 12, the Cliveden set. At the risk of some repetition, the story will be summarized here because the American branch of this organization, sometimes called the Eastern Establishment, has played a very significant role in the history of the U.S. in the last generation. 
The roundtable groups were semi-secret discussion and lobbying groups organized by Lionel Curtis, Philip H. Kerr, Lord Lothian, and Sir William S. Maris in 1908 to 1911. This was done on behalf of Lord Milner, the dominant trustee of the Rhodes Trust in the two decades 1905 to 1925. The original purpose of these groups was to seek to federate the English-speaking world along the lines laid down by Cecil Rhodes, 1853-1902, and William T. Stead, 1849-1912, and the money for the organizational work came originally from the Rhodes Trust. By 1915, roundtable groups existed in several countries, including England, South Africa, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, and a rather loosely organized group in the United States. George Louis Beer, Walter Lippmann, Frank A. Delot, Whitney Shepherdson, Thomas W. Lamont, Jerome D. Green, Erwin D. Canham of the Christian Science Monitor, and others. The attitudes of the various groups were coordinated by frequent visits and discussions by a well informed and totally anonymous quarterly magazine, The Round Table, whose first issue, largely written by Philip Kerr, appeared in November 1910. The leaders of this group were Milner until his death in 1925, followed by Curtis, 1872 to 1955, Robert H. Lord Brand, uh, brother-in-law of Lady Astor until his death in 1963, and now Adam D. Morris, son of Sir William and Brand's successor as managing director of Lazard Brothers Bank. The original intention had been to have collegial leadership, but Milner was too secretive and headstrong to share the role. He did so only in the period 1913 to 19, when he held regular meetings with some of his closest friends to coordinate their activities as a pressure group in the struggle with Wil Wilhelmine Germany. This they called their ginger group. After Milner's death in 1925, the leadership was largely shared by the survivors of Milner's kindergarten, Garten, that is, the group of young Oxford men whom he used as civil servants in his reconstruction of South Africa in 1901 to 1910. Brand was the last survivor of the kindergarten since his death. The greatly re reduced activities of the organization have been ex exercised largely through the editorial committee of the Round Table magazine under Adam Morris. Money for the widely ramified activities of this organization came originally from the associates and followers of Cecil Rhodes, chiefly from the Rhodes Trust itself, and from wealthy associates such as the Bate Brothers from Sir Abe Bailey, and after 1915 from the Astor family. Since 1925, there have been substantial contributions from wealthy individuals and from foundations and firms associated with international banking fraternity, especially the Carnegie United Kingdom Trust and other organizations with J.P. Morgan, the Rockefeller and Whitney families, and the associates of the Lazard brothers and of Morgan, Grenfell and Company. The chief backbone of this organization grew up along already existing financial cooperation running from the Morgan Bank in New York to a group of international financiers in London led by Lazard Brothers. Milner himself in 1901 had refused a fabulous offer worth up to 100000 a year to become one of the three partners of the Morgan Bank in London in succession to the younger J.P. Morgan who moved from London to join his father in New York. Eventually, the vacancy went to E.C. Grenfell, so that the London affiliate of Morgan became known as Morgan, Grenfell & Company. Instead, Milner became director of a number of public banks, chiefly the London Joint Stock Bank, corporate precursor of the Midland Bank. He became one of the greatest political and financial powers in England, with his di disciples strategically placed throughout England in significant places, such as the editorship of the Times, the editorship of the Observer, the managing directorship of Lazard Brothers, various administrative posts, and even cabinet positions. Ramifications were established in polit politics, high fi finance, Oxford and London universities, periodicals, the civil service, and tax-exempt foundations. At the end of the war of 1914, it became clear that the organization of this system had to be greatly extended. Once again, the task was entrusted to Lionel Curtis, who established in England, in each dominion, a front organization to the existing local round table group. This front organization, called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, <coughs> had a, as its nucleus in each area the existing submerged round table group. 
In New York, it was known as the Council on Foreign Relations and was a front for J.P. Morgan and Company in association with a very small American roundtable group. The American organizers were dominated by the large number of Morgan experts, including Lamont and Beer, who had gone to the Paris Peace Conference and there, and there became close friends with a similar group of English experts, which had been recruited by the Milner Group. In fact, the original plans for the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Council on Foreign Relations were drawn up at Paris. The Council of the um, RIIA, which by Curtis's energy came to be housed in Chatham House across St. James's Square from the Astors, and was soon known by the name of this headquarters, and the board of the Council on Foreign Relations have carried over ever since the mark of their origin, the marks of their origin. Until 1960, the council at Chatham House was dominated by the dwindling group of Milner's associates, while the paid staff members were largely the agents of Lionel Curtis. The round table, for years until 1961, was edited from the back door of Chatham House grounds in Ormond Yard, and its telephone came through the Chatham House switchboard. The New York branch was dominated by the associates of the Morgan Bank. For example, in 1928, the Council on Foreign Relations had John W. Davis as president, Paul Kravath as vice president, and a council of 13 others, which included Owen D. Young, Russell C. Leffingwell, Norman Davis, Alan Dulles, George W. Wickersh Wickersham, Frank L. Polk, Whitney Shepardson, Isaiah Bowman, Stephen, Stephen P. Duggan, and Otto Kahn. Throughout its history, the council has been associated with the American Round Tablers, such as Beer, Lippmann, Shepardson, and Jerome Green. The academic figures have been those linked to Morgan, such as James T. Shotwell, Charles Seymour, Joseph P. Chamberlain, Philip Jessup, Isaiah Bowman, and more recently, Philip Mosley, Grayson L. Kirk, and Henry M. Riston. <clears throat> the Wall Street contacts with these were created originally from Morgan's influence in handling large academic endowments. In the case of the largest of these endowments, that at Harvard, the influence was usually exercised indirectly through State Street, Boston, which for much of the 20th century came through the Boston banker Thomas Nelson Perkins. Closely allied with the, this Morgan influence were a small group of Wall Street law firms, whose chief figures were Elihu Root, John W. Davis, Paul D. Kravath, Russell Leffingwell, the Dulles brothers, and more recently Arthur H. Dean, Philip D. Reed, and John J. McCloy. Other non-legal agents of Morgan included men like Owen D. Young and Norman H. Davis. On this basis, which originally uh, financial, which was originally financial and goes back to George Peabody, there grew up in the 20th century a power structure between London and New York, which penetrated deeply into university life, the press, and the practice of foreign policy. In England, the center was the Round Table Group, while in the United States it was J.P. Morgan, and the company or its local branches in Boston, Philip, uh, Philadelphia, and Cleveland. Uh, some rather incidental examples of the operations of this structure are very re revealing, just because they are incidental. For example, it's it set up in Princeton a reasonable copy of the Round Table Group's chief Oxford headquarters, All Souls College. This copy, called the Institute for Advanced Study, and best known perhaps as the refuge of Einstein, Oppenheimer, John V. von Neumann, and George F. Kennan, was organized by Abram Flexner of the Carnegie Foundation and Rockefeller's General Education Board after he had experienced the delights of all souls while serving as Rhodes Memorial Lecturer at Oxford. The plans were largely drawn by Tom Jones, one of Round Table's uh, most active intriguers and foundation administrators. The American branch of this English establishment exerted much of its influence through five American newspapers. The New York Times, New York Herald Tribune, Christian Science Monitor, The Washington Post, and the lamented Boston Evening Transcript. In fact, the editor of the Christian Science Monitor was the chief American correspondent anonymously of the Round Table, <coughs> and Lord, Lo Lord Lothian, the original editor of the Round Table, and later Secretary of Rhodes Trust in 1925-39, an ambassador to Washington, was a frequent writer in the Monitor. It might be mentioned that the existence of this Wall Street Anglo-American axis is quite obvious once it is pointed out. 
It is reflected in the fact that such Wall Street luminaries as John W. Davis, Louis Douglas, Jock Whitney, and Douglas Dillon were appointed to be American ambassadors in London. This double international network in which the round table groups formed the semi-secret or semi or, or, or secret nuclei of the Institutes of International Affairs was extended into a, into a third network in 1925, organized by the same people for the same motives. One again, once again, the mastermind was Lionel Curtis, and the earlier roundtable groups and institutes of international affairs were used as a nuclei for the new network. However, this new organization for, for Pacific Affairs was extended to ten countries, while the roundtable groups existed only in seven. The new additions, ultimately China, Japan, France, the Netherlands, and Soviet Russia, had Pacific councils set up from scratch. In Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, Pacific councils interlocked and dominated by the Institutes of International Affairs were set up. In England, Chatham House served as the English center for both nets, while the United States, in the United States, the, the two were parallel crea creations, not subordinate, of the Wall Street allies of Morgan Bank. The financing came from the same international banking groups and their subsidiary commercial and industrial firms. In England, Chatham House was financed for both networks by the contrib contributions of Sir Abe Bailey, the Astor family, and additional funds largely acquired by the per persuasive powers of Lionel Curtis. The financial difficulties of the IPR councils in the British Dominions, dominions and the Depression of 1929-35 to 35 resulted in in a very revealing effort to save money when the local Institute of International Affairs absorbed the local Pacific Council, both of which were, in a way, expensive and needless fronts for the local round table groups. The chief aims of this elaborate semi-secret organization were largely commendable to coordinate the international activities and outlooks of all the English-speaking world into one, which would largely, it is true, be that of the London group, uh, to work to maintain the peace, to help backward colonial and underdeveloped areas to advance towards stability, law and order, and, the prosperity, and prosperity along lines somewhat similar to those taught at Oxford and the University of London, especially the School of Economics and the School of African and Oriental Studies. These organizations and their financial backers were in no sense reactionary or f fascistic in persons, as communist propaganda would like to depict them. Quite the contrary, they were gracious and cultured gentlemen of somewhat limited social experience who were much concerned with the freedom of expression of minorities and the role of, of law for all, who constantly thought in terms of Anglo-American solidarity, of political particip participation and federation, and who were convinced that they could gracefully civilize the Boers of South Africa, the Irish, the Arabs, and the Hindus, and who are largely responsible for the partitions of Ireland, Palestine, and India, as well as the federations of South Africa, Central Africa, and the West Indies. Their desires to win over the opposition by cooperation worked with Smuts, but failed with Herzog, worked with Gandhi, but failed with Menon, worked with Stressman, but failed with Hitler, and has shown little chance of working with any Soviet leader. If their failures now loom larger than their successes, this should not be allowed to conceal their, the high motives which they attempted both, with which they attempted both. It was this group of people who, whose wealth and influence so exceeded their experience and understanding who provided much of the framework of influence which the communist sympathizers and fellow travelers took over in the U.S. in the late 1930s. It must be recognized that the power that these energetic left-wingers exercisers exercised was never uh, their own power or communist power, but was ultimately the power of the international financial coterie. And once the anger and suspicions of the American people were aroused, as they were in, the in 1950, it was a fairly simple matter to get rid of the red sympathizers. Before this could be done, however, a congressional committee fought. Following backward to their source, the threads which led from ad admitted communists like Whitaker Chambers uh, through Alger Hiss in the Carnegie Endowment to Thomas Lamont in the Morgan Bank uh, fell into the whole complicated network of the interlocking tax-exempt foundations. The 83rd Congress in July 1953 set up a special committee to investigate the tax-exempt foundations with Representative B. Carroll Reese of Tennessee as chairman. It soon became clear that people of immense wealth would be unhappy if the investigation went too far and that the most 
respected newspapers in the country, closely allied with these men of wealth, would not get excited enough about any revelations to make the publicity worthwhile in terms of votes or campaign contributions. An, in an interesting report showed the left showing the left-wing associations of the interlocking nexus of tax-exempt foundations was issued in 1954 rather quietly. Four years later, the the Reese Committee's general counsel, Reen A. Wormser, wrote a shocked but not shocking book on the subject called Foundations, Their Power and Influence. Once the most interesting members of this Anglo-American power structure were Jerome D. Green, 1874-1959, uh, born in Japan of missionary parents. Green graduated from Harvard College in law school by 1899 and became secretary to Harvard's president and corporation in 1901-1910. This gave him contacts with Wall Street, which made him general manager of the Rockefeller Institute, 1910 to 12, assistant to John D. Rockefeller in philanthropic work for two years, then trustee to the Rockefeller Institute, to the Rockefeller Foundation, and to the Rockefeller General Education Board until 1939. <clears throat> for 15 years, 1917 to 32, he was with the Boston investment banking firm at Lee Higginson and Company most of the period as its chief officer, as well as with its London branch. As executive secretary of the American section of the Allied Maritime Transport Council, stationed in London in 1918, he lived in Toynbee Hall, the world's first settlement house, which had been founded by Alfred Milner and his friends in 1884. This brought him in contact with the Round Table Group in England, a contact which was strengthened in 1919 when he was secretary to the Reparations Commission at the Paris Peace Conference. Accordingly, on his return to the United States, he was one of the early figures in the establishment of the Council on Foreign Relations, which served as the New York branch of Lionel Curtis's Institute of International Affairs. As an investment banker, Green is chiefly remembered for his sales of millions of dollars of the fraudulent securities of the Swedish match king, Ivar Kruger. That the Green offered these to the American investing public in good faith is evident from the fact that he put a substantial part of his own fortune in the same investments. As a consequence, Kruger's suicide in Paris on, in April 1932 left Green with little money and no job. He wrote to Lionel Curtis asking for help and was given, for two years, a professorship of international relations at, at, at Barry Stwyth, Wales. The, the Round Table Group controlled that professorship from its founding by Davis, David Davies in 1919, in spite of the fact that Davies, who was made a peer in 1932, had broken with the Round Table because of its subversion of the League of Nations and European collective security. On his return to America in 1934, Green also returned to his secretaryship of the Harvard Corporation and became, for the remainder of his life, practically a symbol of Yankee Boston. As trustee and officer of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, the Gardner, the Gardner Museum in Fenway Court, the New England Conservatory of Music, the American Academy in Rome, the Brookings Institution, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the General Education Board, only until 1939. He was also director of Harvard uh, tercentenary, uh, tercentenary celebration in 1934 through 37. Green is of much greater significance in indicating the real influences within the Institute of pa Pacific Relations than any communists or fellow travelers. He wrote the Constitution for the IPR in 1926, was for years the chief conduit for Wall Street funds and influence into the organization, and was a treasurer of the American Council for three years and chairman for three more, as well as chairman of the International Council for four years. Jerome Green is a symbol of much more than the Wall Street influence in the IPR. He is also a symbol of the relationship between the financial circles of London and those of the eastern U U.S., which reflects one of the most powerful influences in the 20th century American and world history. The two ends of this English-speaking axis have sometimes been called, perhaps facetiously, the English and American establishment. There is, however, a considerable degree of truth behind the joke, a truth which reflects a very real power structure. It is this power structure which the radical right in the U.S. has been attacking for years in the belief that they are attacking the communists. This is particularly true when these attacks are directed, as they so frequently are, at Harvard socialism, or at left-wing newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post. 
or at foundations in their dependent, dependent establishments, such as the Inst Institute of International Inter Education. These misdirected attacks by the radical right did, did much to confuse the American people in the period 1948 to 55 and left consequences which were still significant a decade later. By the end of 1953, most of these attacks had run their course. The American people, thoroughly bewildered at widespread charges of 20 years of treason and subversion, had rejected the Democrats and put into the White House the Republican Party's traditional favorite, a war hero, Dwight D. Eisenhower. At the time, two events, one public and one secret, were still in, the, in process. The public one was the Korean War of 1950-53. The secret one was the race for the thermonuclear bomb.